Okay, so as you can see, we're going to be doing the Harry Potter iceberg. As you can tell from the video here, this is going to be a whopper of a video. There's probably about 153 different theories that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, I would break this up into its own little separate videos, and I might do that. But for starters, I'm going to be doing one massive long iceberg, and I might go in and create other videos uh, breaking it up uh, just for easier digestion. But yeah, I love Harry Potter. Harry Potter is my favorite fandom, even more so than A Song of Ice and Fire. I think I know a fair about about it, and I just really want to seek my teeth into this iceberg. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let's dive into the very first theory in Tier 1, that being... Ron Weasley was almost killed off. So, in the very beginning of her publication, J.K. Rowling said that she had no intention of killing Harry, Ron, or Hermione, just because she feels like that would be like killing one of her kids. But about halfway through the production of the movies, she told Daniel Radcliffe that she had intended to kill off Ron Weasley. Uh, we have no idea how she would have gone about that. Really, there are only a couple options that really could have done done it so it would have made sense in the story the first one would have been when ron weasley was pulled into the shrieking shack maybe she thought that maybe peter Pettigrew could kill ron and that would be how he got away or maybe instead of cedric dying it could have been ron either one of those kind of work out with furthering the plot with also giving harry something to latch on to but yeah this is kind of weird thinking about an alternate universe where ron weasley wasn't a part of the later books Wandless magic. Yeah, there's not a whole lot to say about this. We do know that certain powerful wizards and witches can perform wandless magic. We know that both Voldemort and Dumbledore can do it. They do it quite often. And we know that Ollivander says that you can produce your magic through other means than wands. It's just that wands are the easiest. So yeah, it makes sense. Uh, what comes to mind when I think about wandless magic, however, is when Harry is fighting out the Dementors in Order of the Phoenix and he has his wand knocked out of his hand. And he's laying on the ground. He can't see anything. And he says Lumos, even though his wand is in his hand, and the wand lights up anyway. Now, granted, his wand was only a couple feet away, or a couple inches away from his hand at the time. But it just goes on to prove that Harry really is a powerful wizard in his own right. J.K. Rowling regrets Ron and Hermione's relationship. So, yeah, going back... The relationship between Ron and Hermione to a lot of people doesn't really sit right. And that's just because a lot of the book series are very toxic towards each other. They don't have a very cohesive uh, dynamic. Their personalities clash too much. Now, personally, I like to think that the Ron and Hermione relationship is set up all the way back in book one. And that there's very, very well documented details about how that's set up. But uh, J.K. Rowling has gone on record on saying that she wished that Hermione had ended up with... Uh, Harry and she doesn't really say who Ron would end up with but most people when they refer to this usually pick Luna but yeah um, I personally like them together but I know I'm in the minority Dumbledore is gay yeah I mean JK Rowling has gone on record confirming the fact that Dumbledore is in fact a homosexual and I think that kind of fits into his character in a lot of ways. I don't have a whole lot to say about this one, in all honesty. There's not a whole lot of anything that is added to the text by him being gay. However, I do want to point out, and I'll connect this to I'll actually another part of this tier, and that is the connection between Grindelwald and Dumbledore and the possibility of them being lovers. I don't think that they were ever lovers in the sense that they were having sexual relations or even romantic ones, but I do think that Dumbledore was in love with Grindelwald, and Grindelwald used that love as a way to manipulate Dumbledore into making him more uh, receptive to the idea that wizards need to be on dominated over uh, muggles. So yeah, I think that the reveal that Dumbledore is gay is more to set up the relationship between Grindelwald and Dumbledore more than it is anything else. Seven. Seven is a movie in which a serial killer goes and kills seven people, and each murder is to reflect one of the deadly sins. Why it's on the Harry Potter iceberg, I'm not entirely sure, but moving on. No, no, of course not. No, Seven in this context is simply referring to the fact that Seven is the magical, powerful uh, number in all of the Harry Potter universe. 
Of course, there are seven books, but that's number seven it appears everywhere. There are seven members of the Weasley children. There are seven core component uh, classes that you take at Hogwarts. There are seven Horcruxes, and there are seven players on a Quidditch team. The number seven is reflected all over uh, the Harry Potter universe. You can just pick a, a group of things, and it, chances are that seven is going to be in there somewhere. J.K. Rowling just likes her sy- symmetry, and she picks seven to be the magical number. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville represent Slytherin, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Gryffindor. Yeah, so this is just reflecting the fact that each of our main characters, plus Neville, represent one of the houses. Harry represents Slytherin. Throughout the entire series, he's very, very ambitious. When he is part of the Triwizard Tournament, he decides that he might actually have a chance at winning, which is very ambitious for a 14-year-old. Uh, he has so many plans about the entire series, all the way back in book one, through all seven books. All of his plans are very cunning and ambitious on their own right. Ron uh, Ron is kind of the hard sell here, just because he's supposed to represent Hufflepuff. Uh, now, the problem with that is Hufflepuff's main trait is loyalty, and Ron betrays Harry at least twice in the series. But on the other side of that coin, he comes back every single time and shows him undeniable loyalty. Uh, Hermione obviously is Ravenclaw. The Sorting Hat even considers putting her in Ravenclaw at the beginning of the series. She's very brainy. She's very smart and very resourceful. So that's obvious. And then Neville represents Gryffindor because uh, even all the way back in book one, you see that Neville has the courage to stand up to his friends. Uh, Neville has the ability to lead the rebellion inside Hogwarts in book seven. He kills the uh, last Horcrux in Nagini, and even stands up and basically tells Voldemort that, you know, just because Harry's dead, or so he thinks, that that doesn't mean anything, and they're still going to fight. I like that theory a lot. It's one of my personal favorites. Voldemort, Snape, Harry, and Dumbledore represent the Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, the Invisibility Cloak, and Death. So this is a very popular theory, and let's get into it. So in the tale of the three brothers, the first brother gets the Elder Wand, and he dies because of his arrogance, thinking that he can defeat death. That most represents Voldemort. The Resurrection Stone is the second brother. The second brother uh, commits suicide after longing for a past love. That reflects Snape. Uh, The Invisibility Cloak is held by the third brother, and the third brother was able to greet death with open arms after not being arrogant enough to know that he could escape death entirely. And that's Harry. And finally, Dumbledore, when Harry goes to meet his death in the woods, uh, Dumbledore is the one that meets him there at King's Cross in one of the final chapters of the Deathly Hallows. And that makes Dumbledore death, who Harry uh, greets with open arms. Uh, This is a very popular theory. I know the Super Carlin brothers have a very popular video about how Dumbledore is a representation of death. And while I don't think that J.K. really intended for Voldemort and really definitely not Snape to represent the Deathly Hallows, I can't deny that the parallel between Dumbledore and death is so prevalent. I figure she has to have at least thought about that with her storytelling. Alternate book titles. I mean, yeah, that just kind of happens in all publishing works uh, that J.K. Rowling originally had different titles for a lot of the books, many of the books. Uh, she's going on a record on saying that the Philosopher's Stone was originally going to be Harry Potter and the School of Magic. Uh, and most famously with the Goblet of Fire, she has said that the alternate title was going to be Harry Potter and the Three Champions, and then maybe even Harry Potter and the Death Eaters. Uh, the problem that the reason that she decided to go with Goblet of Fire uh, later on in the publishing cycle was because that the Three Champions and the Death Eater titles were kind of spoilery with her own topic, and she didn't want to like, go into that book with the reader already having like a prior conception of what was going to happen but yeah i think it's kind of interesting how the books would have been received had they been different i can't personally imagine the books being titled anything other than they actually are i think that she just captured lightning in the, bo- in the bottle with a lot of them but yeah i think that it's very interesting to think of an alternate world where you know we had instead of goblet of fire we had harry potter and death eaters for example <laughs> The Quidditch scoring makes no sense. Yeah, J.K. Rowling has gone on record by saying that she's not very familiar with how sports work. And if you look at the Quidditch scoring methods, it doesn't really make much sense. 
each time a quaffle goes through a hoop, it's worth 10 points, whereas the secret catching the snitch is worth 150. So why don't all seven players on the field just get up into the air, look for the snitch, tell the secret where it is, and boom, they win? So yeah, that's just one of those things that you kind of have to just swallow in uh, the Harry Potter universe. Arthur Weasley was almost killed off. Yeah, so the thing about Arthur Weasley, um, J.K. Rowling was going to kill off Arthur, uh, specifically in the scene where he's attacked by the snake. She was going to have him die there, but she's decided against it and decided to kill Sirius off instead because she didn't want to break up the mo- the mother-father relationship with Molly and Arthur with the Weasleys. And yeah, now my friend who recently read the books about a year ago, she brought up a good point, though, that, uh, and she one of the reasons is because she was upset that Sirius died because she loves Sirius. But she brought up a good point that it would have been interesting to see Harry and Ron's relationship after Arthur's death. Because on one hand, yeah, Harry and Ron would have been devastated by Arthur's death. But Harry could have also had that moment, especially in Order of the Phoenix when he's going through so much, that he could tell Ron, well, my parents have been dead for years and I got through it. Why can't you get through it, Ron? Um, I think that would have been a very interesting character study for the two of them. And yeah, uh, I kind of wish, I kind almost kind of wish that Arthur died instead of Sirius also. One, for that dynamic I said earlier, but also I just think that it would have been more devastating of a gut punch to the series as a whole. So yeah, let me know what you guys think about that down in the comments below. The Dementors symbolize depression. Uh, so when she was writing the uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, J.K. Rowling was on record of saying that she was very depressed. She was going through a lot with uh, people in her life dying. And she decided to put a actual physical representation of depression into the series. And that being the Dementors, it makes, you know, that makes sense. The, the Dementors literally make you depressed. Uh, chocolate is a very common thing that people eat when they're depressed for one reason or the other. And that's how you get over a Dementors effects immediately. So yeah, Dementors represent depression. That's pretty self-explanatory. Shit on the floor. Yeah, so, uh, you know, on Pottermore, it stated that, you know, the plumbing system inside of Hogwarts wasn't established until a couple of centuries after the school was founded itself, and the question arose, you know, so how did the kids and the professors go to the bathroom? Well, they apparently just pooped on the floor and then used magic to make it disappear. And, yeah, um, I don't really know what else to say about that. It kind of reminds me of the episode of Family Guy when uh, Stewie and Brian are going to the multiverses and they realize that um, one of the universes had been disappearing in their poop and it was just appearing in another universe. If you've, if you've seen the episode, you know what I mean. Yeah, that's all I got for that. <laughs> And finally, for Tier 1, Fred and George hit Voldemort in the face with snowballs. So, in the Philosopher's Stone, there's that scene where uh, it's around Christmas time. Harry looking out the window, and he sees that Fred and George had charms from snowballs that hit the back of Professor Quarles' turban. And, as we all know, the back of Professor Quarles' head actually had Voldemort on it. So, yeah, the two Weasley brothers actually hit Voldemort in the back of the face with snowballs. And I just think it's hilarious to know that Voldemort could do nothing about that. And he just had to take a face full of cold, like cold water to the face, uh, pretty much whenever the Weasley twins were around. And with that, we're down to tier two. Like I said, every time we go down a tier, the theories get a little bit more uh, illogical and a little bit more crazy. And that's no more exemplified than with this first theory. Ron is a time-traveling Dumbledore. So, a lot of people have pointed out that Ron and Dumbledore have a lot of similarities. Uh, the first one, that they have both have very, very long noses. And then also, they're both very tall. And on top of that, they both support the same uh, Quidditch team. And so, people kind of point out that maybe Dumbledore went back in time to be Harry's best friend to guide him through the through the uh, you know the journey that he was going to go through. Now, the obvious problem with that is Ron abandons Harry not once, but twice. <laughs> For kind of dumb reasons that Dumbledore probably wouldn't have done himself. It's not a true theory, but I think it's kind of fun. And it's just one of those things that people have gone, you know, into the books and like, oh, there's that connection between the two characters. Yeah, no, it's not true, but it's fun.
62442. Yeah, so this one's actually a very easy one to explain. 62442 is the code that you put into the payphone that gets you into the Ministry of Magic. And if you're just curious about what 62442 means, uh, those of you who are a little older, you remember flip phones about how you would text? Well, if you were to text 62442, it would spell magic. The Triwizard Tournament is a mostly boring event for spectators. Yeah, so other than the first task with the dragons, task two and three, the one underwater in, inside the maze would be extremely boring to watch. You realize that Harry was underwater for more than an hour, and you have to think that he was inside the maze in the graveyard for probably close to two or three. And so you just have to kind of wonder what were the spectators and the professors doing for the entirety of those tasks. Now, you can imagine that, you know, maybe Ludo Bagman was giving some kind of like play by play. Uh, or saying something like, oh, you know, the winner of this event will get this. and But he would have to, like, pander for, like, a while. <laughs> I just don't know. I don't know what um, what they were doing. But, yeah, it's just one of those things. If you look into it more closely, it would be boring as heck to actually watch it. The Chamber of Secrets post credit scene. So, in the Chamber of Secrets movie, if you watch past the credits, there's a scene where inside a Diagon Alley, we see a poster of Gilderoy Lockhart and what appears to be some kind of lock suit, uh, you know, with the caption, have you seen this man? Uh, it's kind of sad when you think about it, because in the books, uh, Gilderoy Lockhart ends up inside of a psych ward. <laughs> it's kind of sad when you think about that, but yeah, it's just kind of a, a joke about how awful Lockhart was. <laughs> The Florian Fortescue Abandoned Storyline. So if you don't know who Florian Fortescue was, he was the owner of an ice cream shop inside of Diagon Alley, and while Harry was staying there during a prisoner of Azkaban, he would give Harry free ice cream and help him out with his history of magic homework. J.K. Rowling originally had planned for Florian Fortescue to be a bigger character than he actually turned out to be. In The Haploid Prince, uh, there is that comment that both Fortescue and Ollivander had been kidnapped by the Death Eaters, and that kind of went nowhere. Well, the reason being is that J.K.R. had set up Fortescue to be a master of history and that she had planned on using him to reveal the, you know, the Diadem and the Elder Wand storyline. But she decided against it as there was no real way for her to fit inside how they would have freed Fortescue uh, as well as Ollivander. And by the time that she got there, Ollivander kind of fit both um, points anyway. Uh, you can kind of feel that inside of the scenes inside of the Shell Cottage, how it kind of feels a little bit, you know, disjointed. That's because she had originally planned for both of those things to be revealed here uh, with Florian Fortescue. Hufflepuff is the stoner house. Uh, the only real evidence for them being stoners is that they're kind of laid back most of the time and that they have their house next to the kitchens inside Hogwarts. I mean, you get the munchies. I mean, I think it's just kind of a fun little Easter egg, not even Easter egg, just a nice little fun, you know, what about this moment inside the books? Uh, yeah, that's all I really got to say about that one. Slughorn calling Ron Rupert. So there's a running joke inside of Half-Blood Prince where Slughorn completely ignores Ron, and then the only times that he does um, acknowledge Ron's existence, he calls him by the wrong name. He calls him a whole bunch of names inside of all star of R, but at one point he calls Ron Rupert, which is kind of a, you know, a fun little nod to the fact that Ron's actor, his first name is Rupert. Uh, I think that was kind of intentional by JKR. Uh, but yeah, it's just a fun, fun, fun little Easter egg for book and movie likers, both. Harry is no longer a parcel tongue. Yeah, so after the events of Deathly Hallows, when Harry dies and has the part of Voldemort's soul ripped out of his you know, body, uh, Harry loses all of his powers that Voldemort gave him. Uh, on accident, uh, there's no real textual evidence for it. There's never a part, you know, after that scene where Harry dies that he's able to talk to his snake ever again. But it is mentioned that the scar no longer hurts him, and I like to think that every part of uh, Harry's being that belonged to Voldemort is no longer there anymore. So yeah, I I like that a lot. I think it makes sense. I'm gonna confirm that one personally. The 
muggles could easily beat wizards in a war is a very, very common, not even theory, just thought experiment that what would happen if, you know, Voldemort had actually won, had gone in and started killing the muggles uh, on a mass scale like he wanted to. Well, the thing is, the muggles could have probably beat the wizards with modern technology. They could have easily beat them with guns. I mean, pulling a trigger is, you know, quicker than saying Avada Kedavra. And, you know, then you go into the whole, like, what about nukes? What about this, that, and the other? What about the fact that there are so many more muggles than there are wizards? Uh, Yeah, it's a good little thought experiment. I, You know, realistically, I think that muggles could probably beat wizards, no problem. Uh, Yeah, that's all I got for that. Uh, Let me know what you think down below about that one, but I think it's pretty easy. Irised is desired spelled backwards. Yeah, uh, this is not even a theory. It's just a fact. Uh, if you look at, you know, Irised in a mirror, you turn it around, it becomes desire. Uh, it's pretty on the nose that the mirror of Irised, which shows you every desire, is literally named desire. Also, if you look at the very top of the mirror, there's that entire, you know, encryption of the very top. And if you actually put it in a mirror and spell it backwards, it is also a phrase. I don't remember what the phrase is off the top of my head. It's something to the effect of look into me and find what you truly want or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's not even a theory. It's just a fact. The trace inconsistencies. So the trace is something that is put on underage wizards so that the Ministry of Magic knows when magic is done around an underage wizard and what that magic was. So I think a lot of the inconsistencies, quote unquote, that people have with it is them not really understanding what the trace is. The trace does not tell the Ministry who does the magic. It only tells them when magic is done around an underage wizard. So, for example, Malfoy inside of Malfoy Manor on his summer holidays could probably get away with using magic whenever he wanted to. Just because the ministry had no way of knowing the difference between his parents doing magic and him doing magic. The trace is really only evident to be useful when it's a muggle-born or a wizard like Harry who lives with muggles. That they know that oh, there isn't supposed to be any magic being done here at all. That's when it becomes useful. Uh, I don't really think any off the top of my head what the inconsistencies that can't be explained away would be. But let me know down below and I'll try to answer them the best I can. But yeah. The Teletubby symbols. So this theory says that if you put the Teletubbies together, they all make different symbols inside the Harry Potter universe. For example, if you put together the purple, red, and green Teletubby, they all make the Deathly Hallows symbol. And if you put the yellow one together, it kind of looks like the scar on Harry's forehead. Uh, no. I mean, yes, but no. It's probably just one of it's. It's just one of those things that um, you know, causation, not correlation, type of thing. You know, it, there's no relation there. Voldemort pronunciation just is a simple thing about how do you actually say Voldemort's name. Uh, some people put a hard T at the end, so it'd be Voldemort. Some people say Voldemort. I personally go under the record of saying Voldemort with a, with a soft T just because Voldemort in French means to fear death. And uh, in French, you would be a soft T. So, yeah. <laughs> Other magical sports. So on Pottermore, it is stated that back in more archaic times, before Quidditch was really developed, there were other sports that, you know, wizards used to play. Uh, This is going to sound really weird because it is really weird, but apparently archaic wizards used to play a a form of football. uh, That would be European football, uh, soccer to Americans, with a uh, pig's bladder. They also would use a pig's bladder to play a form of tennis, and they would use kind of like a track method a a speed trial so to speak by just racing on broomsticks i don't know what the wizards have against pigs i I really don't but yeah that's all i really have to say about that i'm kind of glad we never saw that kind of stuff inside the books though (laughs) harry's extended family so this question is just posing why don't we ever see harry's grandparents great aunts great uncles cousins other than dudley etc so, inside the Mirror of Erised scene in the book, we actually do see a, a portion of Harry's extended family, so they did exist at one point. But J.K. Rowling has gone on record on saying that both Lily and James's parents were, were both, you know, they were dead by the time that Harry was born. We know that James was an only child, and the only sibling that Lily had was Petunia. So, it just seems that, you know, Harry just 
did not have a whole lot of extended family. And that kind of makes sense, especially for James' side of the family, just because we know that wizard families are typically very small, with the exception of the Weasleys, and that there just aren't a lot of wizards to begin with in the first place. So yeah, that's all I have to say about that. And with that, we move into Tier 3, just under the iceberg. So with that, let's go into spells that should be unforgivable. An un unforgivable curse is a spell where the effects of that spell on another human being is so awful that it lands you in Azkaban for a life sentence. So you have the Imperius curse that gives you control over somebody, the Cruciatus curse that gives you the ability, the ability to torture somebody, and Avada Kedavra, which is kill somebody. And a lot of people question, well, why can't a spell like Incendio be a spell that is unforgivable because you can, ca you can catch somebody on fire with it? Well, the thing about it is, yes, you can catch somebody on fire with Incendio, but that's not really its intended purpose. Uh, the spell in question for it to be unforgivable, the purpose of the spell has to be a grievous thing against another human being. The only spell that I think that would really fit into that category is Septum Sempra, because the only purpose of that spell is causing Im immense pain and damage to the physical body of an another human being. Uh, so yeah, that's the only real instance I can really think of and the only one that I see argued online. But let me know if you have any other spells down below that you think might be unforgivable. Hagrid, Winky, Trelawney, Alcoholism. This really isn't even really a theory. It's just the fact that all three of these people have some kind of form of alcoholism throughout the books. Hagrid is noted to being constantly at the bar. He's getting drunk quite often. Winky, after her dismissal from Barty Crouch Sr., is seen to be alcoholic. And Shalani is seen to have a lot of sherry bottles as she hides within the room of requirement. It's not really even a theory, it's just a fact. <laughs> Natalie McDonald. So Natalie McDonald was a first year student that was sorted into Gryffindor and Goblet of Fire. Now the reason she's on the iceberg in the first place is because Natalie McDonald is actually a real person. She was a young Canadian girl who was a big fan of the series, but unfortunately she had a terminal illness. And J she wrote J.K. Rowling, you know, saying I'm a big fan, and J.K.R. immortalized her in the books. It's kind of sad we don't ever see more of her as an Easter egg within the series. But to be fair, it would be really, really hard to write a character that's based off a real person like Natalie McDonald just because she didn't want to be accidentally insulting anyway. But yeah, that's why she's on the iceberg. And I think it's a really sad story, but a really good moment for J.K.R. <laughs> The house assignments are meaningless. So this theory is just saying that putting, you know, 11 year olds within a very categorical set at, you know, such a young age is kind of pointless because people change so much from the ages of 11 to the rest of their lives. And even Dumbledore says perhaps that we sort too early when he's talking to Snape inside of the uh, Prince's Tale chapter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the house assignment system is a very good system inside the book from a medicine. It tells people who everybody is, what their characteristics will generally be. But I think if J.K.R. could go back and kind of, you know, tweak it a little bit, she probably would. Hermione's white face does not refer to her race. So, while the gang was inside the woods outside the Quidditch World Cup, Harry remarks that Hermione has a very white face, and that this is, and that this theory is stating that that refers to the fact that she was very pale with fear, not necessarily the color of her skin. So, this is kind of like an over-encompassing thing about how people are very encompassed with the idea that Harry, Hermione has to be white or has to be black after a black actress was cast in The Cursed Child to play Hermione. And honestly, I don't think it really matters. Uh, there's evidence for both sides I can get into, but I don't think it really matters. As long as the actress plays Hermione the way Hermione is supposed to be played, I think that it just doesn't really matter the color of her skin. I don't know why people get so worked up over it. No married professors. So, yeah, this is just a fact of the matter that none of the professors are married at Hogwarts, you know. Now, I will say that there is that instance that uh, Professor McGonagall was married prior to her becoming a professor. But this theory is more stating the fact that it would be almost impossible for the professors to be married because they spend the majority of their lives at Hogwarts. And that there's no way that they could accompany a spouse with them at any time. 
but yeah, if you think about a professor's life at Hogwarts, it's kind of sad. I mean, yeah, they get to you know shape minds and whatnot, but they really don't have any kind of personal life outside of their co-workers. Durmstrang's location. So yeah, Durmstrang's location has never been verified by either the books or a canon source. Uh, most people kind of believe that it's probably in like Western Russia or maybe Northern Europe. Uh, I think that there's something to be said that, you know, because Crumb played for the Bulgarian team, it could be possible that it's in Bulgaria. Uh, but it's definitely in kind of like an Eastern European, Northern European area, just because of all the names that come out of Dermstring, as well as the name Dermstring itself is a very Eastern European Russian name. Uh, and also, it's stated to be very cold because the uniform that the students wear there is always full of, like, you know, furs and whatnot. So, yeah, um, I don't really know what, what my theory is. My theory is probably around Bulgaria just because that's where Crumb played for Quidditch. But, yeah, um, that's all I got for that. Mrs. Norris is secretly a person. Now, before you write this one off, uh, there are a lot of instances in the book about how an animal turns out to be a, you know, an actual human being, most notably at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban. Then you have Rita Skeeter becoming a beetle. Uh, within the um, Fantastic Beasts, you have Nagini turning out to be a real human being. And Mrs. Norris does have a lot of you know human traits, most notably that she's able to go and inform uh, Filch of when a student is acting out of terms with the rules and how she's basically a snitch and how every student at Hogwarts hates her. Um, if you're going to make Mrs. Norris a person, I think it'd be most sense that she'd kind of be in the Nagini camp of a person that was, you know, used, it was a person that had a, a curse put on them at birth and it turned them into a cat or, you, or, but I think most notably it's probably more that Mrs. Norris is a Neasel, uh, kind of like Crookshanks is, uh, because, you know, Neasels are known to be having almost human characteristics, Nobody fixed Harry's eyesight. So this theory is just saying that in the magical world where all these things are possible, nobody sat Harry down and gave him like magical laser eye surgery. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think that's a pretty good point. Um, why didn't they just fix Harry's eyesight? Now, uh, I think it mostly because JKR didn't want to go into like the mechanics of magic that early in the books. And by the time that she figured out the magic system a little bit better, there was no real point uh, because Harry's eyesight had already, you know, been become so famous with him wearing glasses. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. I think it'd be kind of funny, though, that if, you know, Harry accidentally got a botched eye surgery done on him and he has to spend like, I don't know, a portion of uh, Prisoner of Azkaban trying to like work his eyes back to normal. <laughs> Ron's joke inside the Haploid Prince. So I believe this is referring to the fact that Ron tries to tell a joke to Madame Rosmerda about a hag, a healer, and a mimbulous Mimbletonia. And Madame Rosmerda obviously doesn't reply, doesn't isn't really interested in Ron because he's a teenager. But um, the problem is we never really found the punchline of the joke. In the skit, The Queen's Handbag, uh, Ron tries to tell Hermione the joke, but Hermione just, you know, she's very, very... Uh, literal with the joke and she says that hags aren't vegetarian so maybe the joke has something to do with the hag eating a mimbleus mimbletonia and goes to a healer maybe that has something to do with it um but yeah i think it's just kind of a funny thing now i will say that you could kind of dig into the weeds a little bit here and say that uh this is kind of a a clue that madame rosmerda was under the imperious curse because she doesn't really reply to the joke at all i don't know i think that it's probably not anything there, but just just an idea. The Queen's Handbag is a skit that was performed by uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Emma Watson, Rupert Grant, and Matthew Lewis to celebrate the Queen's 80th birthday in England. So basically the plot is very, very simple. Uh, basically the uh, royalty line, the, the palace, I don't know what you call it over there, uh, writes Hogwarts saying that they need somebody with magic to help them find the queen's very important handbag. And at the very end of the skit, Hermione writes back to the queen saying that you, they have the authority to use magic to use the Asio spell themselves so that they can find it. Uh, I was actually kind of interested in this. I never really heard about the queen's handbag before, but yeah, anything from the Harry Potter universe, I'm going to be watching. It's only three minutes and I did watch it. It's very funny. Uh, check it out on YouTube if you're curious.
Harry took the map back from Barty Crouch Jr.'s office. So yeah, at the end of Goblet of Fire, there's never a scene or anything about how Harry got the map back, the Marauder's map back from Barty Crouch Jr. Now, uh, I do think that it's just kind of like one of those implied things, but the problem with it is that Dumbledore found out about the map in this you know, scene with the Veritaserum chapter, so it's kind of weird that Dumbledore never brought up to Harry about, hey, where do you get this map from? Why is there a map? This is a very dangerous, magical option uh, object. Can you please not use this? Give it to me, kind of thing. It would be almost out of Dumbledore's character to do that, but it is kind of weird that we never have that scene or even just like a little line about, you know, on their way out of the office, Harry snatched it or something like that. Asphodel and Wormwood. So this is referring to the questions that Snape poses to Harry in his first ever potions lesson. And the reason it's on the iceberg in the first place is because of the fact that people have noticed that when you actually look up the actual meanings between Asphodel and Wormwood, it basically translates to, I regret Lily's death. And I, I highly doubt that JKR actually meant that all the way back in Philosopher's Stone. I mean, she probably did know about Snape's true in, uh, intentions, but at the same time, I just don't think that that kind of an Easter egg would be that thorough, if you know what I mean. But yeah, it is interesting that if you actually look at it, it can mean that uh, with certain interpretations and liberties. Harry and Ron's predictions for divination become true. So yeah, inside of the Goblet of Fire, there's a scene where Harry and Ron are working on divination homework, and they're basically just making up things that they know that Trelawney will you know, eat up. But if you actually look at them, a lot of them do come true. So there's one that says Harry will be at risk for burns. Yeah, he was because of the dragons. Then there's the uh, prediction that he will lose a treasured object, which was obviously Ron in the second task. And then there's one where he's backstabbed by a friend. Now, the last one could be referring to Ron because Ron kind of backstabbed him. But I think it mostly refers to Barty Crouch Jr. actually being Mad-Eye Moody and him being betrayed by who he thinks is a friend in Moody. Uh, yeah, there's actually a lot of those things inside of uh, the Harry Potter world with divination. Uh, Trelawney has a lot of them, which will make a prediction. And, you know, all, the entire audience is thinking that it, won't, it means nothing because Trelawney is a big fraud. But one way or another, it usually turns around to be true if you interpret it a certain way. I think that this is a very good foreshadowing by JKR. And it's just a nice little, fun little Easter egg that people who read the books can pick up on. No first years knew what the sorting ceremony would be. So this is just stating the fact that it's very weird that with so many pureblood families like the Weasleys and the Malfoys, it's kind of weird that no one told them what the sorting ceremony would be. Uh, so the thing about this is there's actually a very popular theory that the sorting ceremony has a Fidelius charm put on it and only people who do the sorting, so maybe professors at Hogwarts like Dumbledore, Flitwick, and McGonagall can actually reveal what the sorting ceremony actually is. Uh, I think that makes the most sense because you have to explain away why people like Malfoy and you know Ron, etc. have no idea what the sorting ceremony would be and why hit their parents or siblings wouldn't have just told them at some point. Like, I can't really see Percy not telling Ron if Ron asks, you know what I mean? So that's my personal theory. There's a Fidelius charm in the sorting ceremony with it. Uh, yeah, um, that explains the way to me. Goblins and anti-Semitism. So I don't want to get into the politics of this too much, but basically this is just saying that JKR was a little anti-Semitic by using goblins as the bankers of the wizarding world. Uh, so the reason that this is a theory in the first place is because there's a very big stereotype that Jewish people are obsessed with money and that they're very good with money and that she has goblins be the bankers. Uh, and there's also the fact that the goblins have very long hooked noses. They're very short. They're kind of angry. Uh, and people like to think that the goblins are a stand-in for Jewish people. I guess I don't want to go into the politics of it too much, but I do see where people are coming from with it. I just personally think that it's one of those things where J.K.R. just wasn't really thinking about that when she wrote the books. And people just, after the fact, came in and realized it. Order of the Phoenix PTSD. So, yeah, um... 
obviously Harry has a lot of PTSD in Order of the Phoenix. Uh, Order of the Phoenix is actually my favorite book out of the series, which is a very controversial take. But one of the reasons it is, is it really shows how Harry deals with the mental trauma of witnessing Cedric's death, the trauma he went through by being tied to the gravestone and, you know, cut up, fighting Voldemort, etc. Uh, yeah, Harry has a lot of PTSD. You can tell in his major mood swings. You can tell by his very dark thoughts. A lot of people like to think that the reason that Harry acts the way that he does in the books is because of Voldemort's influence with occupancy. And while that might be part of it, I think that kind of takes away from Harry's trauma that he uh, experienced up leading up to War of the Phoenix. And I think that the end of the War of the Phoenix is a very, uh, very sad yet very powerful message of Harry dealing with his PTSD after Sirius's death and the trauma of that and him dealing with it in a more powerful way i'm actually going to make a video about that about how harry copes with ptsd and order of the phoenix and why it's such a powerful message behind it but yeah um i just think that people who are more trained on this would be better off talking about it but it's definitely there harry has seen star wars uh i mean this is just referring to the fact that harry was raised in the you know, the 80s and the early 90s, and there's almost no way he didn't at least see Star Wars in some capacity. Uh, Star Wars was a major uh, sensation running through the entire, uh, you know, world at one point, and Harry definitely would have seen it. Now, I do think it's very unlikely that the Dursleys would have taken Harry to go see a movie, but there's no way Harry didn't at least see a commercial for it on TV. There's no way he didn't see it through osmosis at some point, especially when he was a little bit older and had more spending money. He kind of could have gone himself. Yeah, there's no way Harry hadn't seen Star Wars, and I think it's kind of ironic that... And the reason that Harry never brings it up is because Star Wars is a copywritten thing that J.K.R. couldn't have put into her book. But I do think that um, it would have been fun to have a little Easter egg about it. Dumbledore repaired Hagrid's wand. So yeah, this is a very, very common theory. Honestly, I'd probably put it up higher on the iceberg, honestly, that Dumbledore repaired Hagrid's wand. We know that Hagrid's wand was cut in half when he got expelled from Hogwarts, but he, he obviously has some kind of magical facilitator in his umbrella. And this theory says that Dumbledore repaired Hagrid's wand and hid it inside the umbrella so that the Ministry wouldn't have been suspicious and kind of just saying that Hagrid was innocent and Dumbledore knew that, but he couldn't do anything about it. So... Um, the thing about the, the real evidence for this though, is that Harry uses the elder wand to repair his own wand at the very end of Deathly Hallows. Dumbledore was in possession of the elder wand. We know the elder wand can repair, wa uh, other wands that are beyond repair. And yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that that's what happened is Dumbledore used the elder wand to repair Hagrid's. Nobody stopped the Dursleys from abusing Harry. So, yeah, that basically is stating the fact that, you know, Dumbledore apparently had such a close eye on Harry throughout his entire life, including his younger years. So why didn't he, he himself, or why didn't he ever send somebody to protect Harry from the Dursley's borderline, you know, almost killing him with starvation and physical abuse and whatnot? Well, so the thing is, Dumbledore had to keep Harry at the Dursley's so that he would be protected from the Death Eaters. And on top of all that, I just don't think that J.K. Rowling really had thought about that when she was writing Philosopher's Stone and then maybe even Chamber of Secrets. And by the time that the Prisoner of Askman came through, and I think that's why Prisoner of Askman has Harry really standing up to him, for himself to the Dursleys in the, in the very first couple of chapters. Um, I just, but she had written herself into a corner, basically. However, I will say I do like that moment at the end of Order of the Phoenix when the Order comes to King's Cross Station and basically tells the Dursleys, like, hey... We're not going to let you do that anymore. If we get so much of a whiff that, you're, that Harry's being mistreated by you, we will come personally and mess you up. Uh, I do like that a lot. Um, that's a very wholesome moment. And, yeah, unfortunately, I just think it's one of those things where she wrote herself into a corner in the first couple books, and she had to go back and retroactively try to fix it. Dumbledore's joke in Goblet of Fire. So, yeah, this is kind of similar to Ron's joke in Half-Blood Prince. At the Desire Term Feast, Dumbledore is about to tell a joke about a troll, a hag, and a leprechaun walking into a bar. And we never get to hear the end of it because McGonagall interrupts him from, you know, that tangent he was about to go on. Uh, so, the thing about that, though, is I don't think that there is an answer to what the joke actually was. A blank, blank, and blank walk into a bar is a very popular, you know, 
joke. I think it's just JK really having a little bit of fun with the with the concept of putting magical things in a very muggle concept. Fred and George saw Peter with Ron on the Marauders map. So yeah, this is a very famous plot hole that J.K. Rowling actually made, basically saying that if Fred and George had the Marauders map, there's no way that he they would not have seen Peter on the map during Ron's first two years of school. So yeah, this is honestly just a plot hole, unfortunately. But I did hear a theory, and I kind of agree with it, that the reason that that's the case is because um, the Marauders initially put a charm on the map that protected the map, protected them from the map itself, basically so that they cannot be seen on the map. So just in case the map fell into the wrong hands, they cannot be tracked with it. And then when Lupin got the map back from Harry, he broke that charm so that he could look for Sirius on the map throughout the year. And that's why uh, towards the end of the book, Lupin is able to see Peter and Sirius on the map. Whereas Harry, Fred, and George could not see Sirius or Peter before that point. And with that, we clear Tier 3 and quickly move into Tier 4. Starting with... How are how and why are the Weasleys so poor? Uh, honestly, I have a very easy explanation for this. So the problem that people run into is if they are magical, why can't the Weasleys just produce magic, magical money and pay for things that way? And there is, uh, there's an actual reason behind that. It's stated that... Uh, rich metals such as gold, silver, and bronze cannot be reproduced authentically with magic. So that is why the wizard's currency, uh, you know, galleons, canuts, and um, sickles are made out of those metals. It's to prevent inflation, basically, inside the magical economy. And that's why you can't just, the Weasleys can't just magical themselves to be rich. Um, if you didn't know that, I, I hope that it was informative to you. But yeah, um, that's all I got for that. So. What happened to Ludo Bagman? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question that we really don't ever have an answer to. The only, the last thing we hear about Ludo Bagman is that he goes on the run after the events of Goblet of Fire because he owes the Goblins so much money. And the last reference to him really is when Cornelius Fudge says he doesn't even think Ludo Bagman would take uh, odds so long in reference to the mentors appearing in Little Winging. Uh, so I don't really have an answer for this. I guess you could say either he was in hiding for the rest of the books. Uh, if you really want to go dark with it, you could say that the goblins caught up to Ludo Bagman and you know killed him uh, for his money, for their for his debt. Um, that's really the only thing I can really think of. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think about that. I really that's the only thing I can think of is that the goblins caught up to him eventually. Because why else would we not hear about him? You would think that J.K. Rowling would have kept him inside of maybe like a little cameo appearance or even a mention in the Deathly Hallows, like she did with so many other characters. So yeah. Dean Thomas's father. So uh, in the books, it stated that Dean's father walked out on his mother when he was very young and that he never actually knew if his father was in fact a wizard or not, leading him to believe he could in fact be Muggleborn, which is why he went on the run inside the Deathly Hallows. Now, unfortunately, however, we do know the tragic story about Dean's father as it was re revealed on Pottermore. Dean's father was, in fact, a wizard, and during the very first Wizarding War, uh, when the Death Eaters began to take over, he went on the run to protect his son and his wife. And because obviously him being a muggle, you know, a half-blood probably wouldn't be very accommodating to the Death Eaters, or at least that was the view that his father had, and then his father was murdered by the Death Eaters when, they, when he refused to join their cause in the first Wizarding War. It's just all very tragic that he decided that he had to leave his, you know, his son and his wife so that he could protect them, and then he ended up dying because he refused to join the Death, the Death Eaters. And it's even more tragic when you think about the Death Eaters probably would have accepted Dean's father, and maybe even Dean, just because Dean was a half-blood and the majority of Death Eaters are at least in some combination not pure blood. So yeah, it's all very tragic and sad. Um, I didn't know about this until doing research for this uh, project, but yeah, let me know what you think about that down below. I don't think it's very common knowledge. How and when did Nagini and Voldemort meet? 
So yeah, this is obviously asking the question, how do these two entities that were so close come together? So we know it would have had to have been between the first and second Wizarding War because there's no mention of Voldemort having a snake in the first one. And we know that he turned Nagini into a Horcrux in that interlude period. But we don't actually know how they met. And I strongly believe that the Fantastic Beasts films will probably give us some kind of context of this because it does have Nagini as a character in, in, the, in those films. I like to think that, you know, maybe Nagini was, a, she, you know, the process of her becoming a snake had taken its full effect. She had gone to Albania to live the rest of her life. And Voldemort, uh, during his exile, met Nagini there. And because Nagini used to be a human, you know, using parcel mouth, they got very close. And that was as close as Voldemort ever got to a true friend. So, yeah, uh, that's how I personally feel. I, I wish I could give more context, but without the Fantastic Beasts films, we don't really know. J.K. Rowling is a squib slash is Rita Skeeter. So this is a very, uh, it's, not, I mean, it's not a theory, it's just a fun little thought experiment that J.K. Rowling is actually Rita Skeeter in disguise or a squib and that she decided to go to the uh, muggle world after the events of uh, the Deathly Hallows book and make tons of money with the amazing story that was the Harry Potter world in the Second Wizarding War, uh, war and she might have uh, embellished a couple points uh, to make more money. And that is kind of a Rita Skeeter thing to do if you think about it. You know, embellishing a story that she has no real context of for the sake of making money and getting views on her content. Um, yeah, I. it's obviously not true, but I, it's a fun little thought experiment. The Horcrux inside of Harry made the Dursleys hate him. Yeah, so we know that a Horcrux, when it's in close vicinity to another human being, can make them hateful, make them have evil thoughts, etc. And, yeah, so Harry being a Horcrux, he would have been around the Dursleys for 11 years, pretty much nonstop, and that made the Dursleys hate Harry. Uh, the context for this is, yes, during the very first chapter of Philosopher's Stone, the Dursleys were not great people, but they weren't as you know cartoonishly evil as they are represented in come the second chapter of that book. And the theory states that because Harry had a part of Voldemort's soul inside of him, the Dursleys uh, were affected by it, making them lash out at Harry without them really understanding why. Yeah, I, I mean, I like that theory a lot. I personally believe it to be true. It makes a whole lot of sense. And when you think about it... Um, Petunia and Lily, in their later, like, late teenage, early young adult lives, they weren't close, but they weren't hateful towards each other. We know that because Petunia sent a vase to uh, Lily for Christmas one year after Harry's birth, so they had to be at least somewhat within, like, you know, they, they, they write each other every now and again. So, and but then that 180 flip of them hating Harry, I just don't see that being rational. So, yeah, I like that theory a lot. Voldemort was physically incapable of love. Yeah, honestly, I would put this one higher on the iceberg because it's basically confirmed. Voldemort was actually quite incapable of loving another human being, another creature, because he was conceived under a false love of a love potion by Merope Gaunt and Tom Riddle Sr. Um, I think that kind of explains why we have such a cartoonishly evil character in the series, but it still makes sense within the logic of the series. Because you look at other characters, like, like other evil characters like Grindelwald, Bellatrix, and Barty Crouch Jr., and you have to admit that in some capacity, they did, were capable of love. Bellatrix and Barty Crouch Jr. had a obsessive love over Voldemort, but it was still love. And, you know, you look at Grindelwald, who was not as... He, I feel like he cared about Dumbledore, at least to a certain extent. And he did care about the wizarding race as a whole. He was just going about it in a very backwards way. So, yeah, I think that that theory is basically canon. <laughs> The 13 people dining prediction in Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah, so this is stating that the fact that Professor Trelawney makes a prediction that when 13 people dine, the first to rise is to certainly die. And the thing about this is it turns out to be true because originally when Professor Trelawney makes that prediction, she's talking about herself being the 13th person. But at the table, there was already 13 people unknowingly because Peter Pettigrew was already there in the disguise of Scavers. And Dumbledore rises to go 
to greet Trelawney, and he, of the people at that table, was the first to die. Uh, yeah, I, that, like I was talking about when the Harry and Ron divination homework predictions on Tier 3, it's one of those instances of there being a very outlandish prediction that ends up becoming true uh, later on when we figure out all the secrets of everything. Uh, I really like that J.K. Rowling was able to make that yeah, work, and then uh, we were able to figure it out through context clues, and it wasn't just spoon-fed to us. That awful boy was Snape. Again, I feel like this should be higher up on the iceberg. So, in Order of the Phoenix, during the Peck of Owls chapter, um, Petunia mentions that she overheard that awful boy and her talk about the Dementors, and Harry assumes that the awful boy that she was referring to was James, and obviously her was Lily. But actually, with the context of everything, it was actually Snape, and we know that for a fact because in the Princess Tale chapter, we actually see that conversation between Lily and Snape, and we see that Petunia had overheard the entire conversation. So yeah, this is basically confirmed. I don't understand why it's not higher on the iceberg. But yeah, I uh, I like that a lot. It's very good context clues. It's not one of those things that wasn't spoon-fed to us. And we had to figure out our own context clues later. But yeah, I really, I really enjoy that one. Harry has the same glasses for seven years. Uh, yeah, I guess he did. Um, I know that people who wear glasses, I really don't, so I really can't speak on it too certainly. They typically change their glasses as they go through puberty just because their face changes, will get bigger, get smaller, more toned out, etc. And the fact that Harry keeps his, keeps his glasses for seven years straight uh, is kind of unrealistic, but I mean, magic exists. Maybe he just really was a, fa- a big, big fan of those glasses and he just magically converted their size. Uh, that's all I have to say about that one. I don't understand why it's this low on the iceberg, but yeah. The Battle of Hogwarts is the very is the first six books in reverse order. I personally love this theory, so let's get into it. So basically, it's saying that the events of the Battle of Hogwarts represents various aspects of the very of the first six books that Harry went through along his journey. So let's start with Half Blood Prince. In the Half Blood Prince, Harry and Dumbledore apparate into Hogsmeade, and then a bartender, Madame Rose Murda, helps them out. At the very beginning of the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry, Ron, and Hermione apparate into Hogsmeade, and a bartender, Aberforth, helps them out. Then you go down to Order of the Phoenix. In Order of the Phoenix, the DA uses the rumor requirement for training purposes. And then in the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry, Ron, and Hermione go into the rumor requirement looking for the diadem. Then you have Goblet of Fire. In Goblet of Fire, Harry uses a broomstick to avoid a fire in the form of a dragon and while he's looking for a very precious object, that being the Golden Egg. In the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry is riding on a broomstick avoiding the Fiend Fire while looking for the Horcrux. In Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry leaves the Shrieking Shack and then fights off a very large group of Dementors. In the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry uh, fights off a very large group of Dementors and then enters the Shrieking Shack. In Chamber of Secrets, the Sword of Gryffindor reveals itself to a very prominent Gryffindor, and he uses it to kill a giant snake in the form of the Basilisk. At the end of the Battle of Hogwarts, the Sorting Hat reveals the Sword of Gryffindor to Neville, and he uses it to kill a giant snake in the form of Nagini. And then finally, at the very end of the Battle of Hogwarts, Harry is still alive after surviving the Killing Curse, and is the reason that the, for the downfall of Voldemort. I personally love this theory. I think it's very intentional by J.K. Rowling, and uh, like I said, it's not one of those instances of something not being like spoon-fed to us, but we can pick up on the context clues and theorize and figure these things out. I love this theory. It's one of my personal favorites. Uh, yeah, honestly, I'd probably put this in like top five personal fan theories of the entire verse. Voldemort's plan, the Goblet of Fire, is convoluted. Yeah, so let's talk about Voldemort's plan. First, he has Barty Crouch Jr. and Wormtail kidnap Mad-Eye Moody. Mad-Eye Moody is one of the most powerful wars that's ever come out of the Ministry, and a lot of Death Eaters ended up in Azkaban solely because of him. So that was extremely uh, risky in its own right. Then he had Barty Crouch Jr. pretend to be Mad-Eye Moody under Dumbledore's no- Dumbledore's nose for an entire school year. He had Barty Crouch Jr. guide Harry through the Triwizard Tournament, and then finally he had Mad-Eye Moody slash Barty Crouch Jr. put a port key spell on the Triwizard Cup so Harry could be transported to the graveyard where Voldemort would be resurrected. Okay, so much of that could have gone wrong. Step one, Mad-Eye Moody could have easily have defeated Barty Crouch Jr. and Wormtail. 
then there's no guarantee that Barty Crouch Jr. could have uh, fooled Dumbledore for that long. There's no telling that Barty Crouch Jr. could have guided Harry that thoroughly through the Triwizard Tournament. And, like, what if Barty Crouch Jr., when he asked to put the Triwizard Tournament in the middle of the maze, what if uh, Dumbledore just said, no, uh, we'll have Bagman or, or somebody do it? Like, that is extremely convoluted. Now, you could say that the plan of you know, kidnapping Mad-Eye Moody was necessary just because he needed an inside man at Hogwarts. Fine, Barty Crouch Jr. and really even Wormtar are both pretty decent wizards. A tag team duo of them taking out Mad-Eye Moody unawares. It's theoretically not the most crazy thing in the world. But then having him pretend to be Mad-Eye Moody under Dumbledore's nose for an entire year is awful. My, my question is, why didn't Barty Crouch Jr. just put a port key spell on a piece of parchment have Harry touch it, and boom, he's right there in the in the courtyard or in the graveyard rather, for you know Voldemort to take uh, the blood from him. Yeah, it's extremely convoluted. It could have been done a different way. Really, it's just for you know narrative structure in the book. But there you have it. The Chamber of Secrets predates plumbing. Yeah, I mean, this is just a fact. When Salazar Slytherin built the Chamber of Secrets, there was no plumbing at Hogwarts. But the problem with that is how did the Basilisk get into the pipes in order to travel around the school undetected? Uh, the, the, my personal explanation, I think, is uh, the most obvious, is that the Basilisk would just travel through the tunnel that led up to the Chamber of Secrets, work its way up to the uh, slide thing that uh, goes into Moni Myrtle's bathroom, and up going through that slide, that's when the pipes are appearing in the system, and he slid through those. But yeah, I mean, there's not much to say about that one. It's pretty obvious to me, yeah. The Time Turner aged Hermione. Yeah, this is actually something that you have to think about. But yeah, Hermione traveled through time quite a few hours upon hours upon hours throughout the events of Prisoner of Azkaban to be at her classes all the time. And that would have probably aged her up a couple of hours. Now, you might think that a couple of hours here and there probably don't mean anything. But you figure, okay, maybe she's taking three extra hours of classes every uh, day for five days a week. That's 15 hours a week. You know, that adds up over time. It probably would have aged her up at least a couple of weeks, maybe a month even. Uh, during out the, during the events of Prisoner of Azkaban, so yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. Hermione's always been a little bit more mature than the rest of the boys. I don't think a couple of weeks or a month even really would have changed that. But yeah, it does kind of give an explanation about why Hermione is so much more mature come the events of Goblet of Fire, at least. Snape hates Neville because Neville could have been the chosen one. Yeah, I, I think that makes the most sense. There's no real reason for Snape to hate Neville other than the fact that Neville is simply uh, inept uh, in the very beginning of the series. Um, but I think it makes more sense that Snape looks at Neville and he says, you know, why couldn't it have been you? Why couldn't your parents have died and saved Lily? Uh, now, that might be a very awful thing, but you also have to realize Snape is very vindictive a lot of the time. And you can see his logic there. Like, the love of his life would have still been alive if Neville simply would have been the chosen one. And he takes out that hatred that he feels and that sadness about Lily's death partially out on Neville and then obviously more on Harry. But yeah, I think that makes the most sense. James and Lily's age. I think because of the movies, we assume that Lily and James were a lot older than they were when they died. Because in the Sorcerer's Stone movie, they're portrayed maybe in their late 30s, early 40s. But in real, realistically, James and Lily were only 21 years old when they died uh, at the, of Voldemort's hand. And I think that's really sad because I know for my, I'm, I'm 25 years old, and I always think that Lily and James were the perfect parents. They were the perfect people that were the embodiment of everything that Harry loved in this world. But in realistically, they were just young adults, barely making it through, and they they were at war, and they were on a freaking death list by the, basically the version of, um, you know, Wizard Hitler. You know, it's kind of kind of tragic when you think about it that they were so young when they died, and you can honestly, re you know, refer that to Peter, Sirius, and Lupin. They were all super young when they when their lives got turned upside down. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have to say about that. But really, if you think about it, it's very very tragic. The magic gene. 
Yeah, this is just saying that magic capabilities are passed on uh, by bloodline from one generation to the next through genetics. Uh, this is m- most obviously seen in Muggleborns because for a Witcher wizard to be a Muggleborn, they would have had to have been, uh, there would have had to have been a Witcher wizard in their family tree reasonably close to their birth in order for them to uh, get that gene passed on to them. And that's why pure blood wizards are very, almost always, witches are wizards and not squibs. Squibs are the notable exception here, and it seems that the magical dream might be recessive, just because not everybody gets it when they're uh, born, obviously, because that's how squibs are born. Um, I don't want to go into the biology, because I suck at science of this, but yeah, I think that you can probably make one of those square things that you did in biology class and figure out you know, how the magic gene actually works. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I have to say about that. There's not, Honestly, I probably would put this one higher on the iceberg personally, but hey, that's all you got to do. Dumbledore's Mirror of Erised Vision. So yeah, this is referring to in the Philosopher's Stone, Dumbledore tells Harry that he sees a pair of socks when he looks inside the mirror, but then Harry later realizes that that probably wasn't true, but it was a personal question to ask. Now, the most common theory, I think that's the one I'm going to go with, is that Dumbledore, when he looks inside the mirror, he sees himself, Grindelwald, Ariana, Aberforth, and his mother all living happily together without any of the awful things that had ever happened to them. And that's also that's also very similar to what Harry sees, but I think the difference between Dumbledore and Harry's vision is that Dumbledore sees these things after the fact. He had only He had gone down a path that he didn't want to go down. Whereas Harry was only seeing those things because of the love that he had actually felt for his family. I don't know. I think that Dumbledore's vision is very sad. And when you look at Dumbledore's life, it's so tragic. And it really contextualizes the character a lot better when you realize that Dumbledore saw all these people that he lost. But he lost them because of his own actions. Uh, I think that that is very tragic for the character. How did the basilisk fit in the pipes? So I think this is a result of the movieisms. The movie really in the Chamber of Secrets really uh, portrays the basilisk as being a very large snake, like domineering, huge. And there's no reasonable way it could have fit in the pipes. But in the books, the basilisk is a lot more reasonably sized. It's still a very large snake, but it's about the size of a probably a very large snake in our world, maybe just a little bit magically bigger. And it's more reasonable that it could fit inside the pipes. That explains why there's not any obvious clue about why what what the basilisk was prior to them figuring it out. Because if you think about it, if Hermione had gone into the library and figured everything out, runs into Penelope Clearwater, and then runs into the basilisk, there's no way that Ginny could have had the basilisk with her and not anybody see it if it was that big. Um, so yeah, that's just a movieism. The basilisk is actually a lot smaller than it actually is in the books. <laughs> Sally Ann Perks. Sally Ann Perks was the student that was sorted right before Harry during the sorting ceremony in the Philosopher's Stone's book. The problem, though, is we never hear about her again. Now, to be fair, we don't hear about every other student at Hogwarts or even in Harry's year at every single point. But the problem is, during the OWL examination, the students are called in in alphabetical order to take their practical exam, and Sally Ann is not mentioned at all, even though the people right before Harry alphabetically all are mentioned. The most common theory, other than this, this being a minor plot hole, is that maybe during the events of Goblet of Fire, Sally Ann transferred to, Dur- to Durmstringer Bobatons, and that's why we don't see her in the fifth year. Or maybe she transferred before that and we just never saw her again. She wouldn't have came with Bobatons be- or Durmstring because she wasn't old enough to participate in the Triwizard Tournament anyway. But yeah, that's just Sally Ann Perks. Not a lot to say about her, but yeah. Hagrid was kept alive so he could carry Harry out of the forest. Yeah, so J.K. Rowling has said that she had a vision of the very last scenes of the series while she was writing and thinking about the Philosopher's Stone. And the vision she kept on seeing was Hagrid carrying Harry out of the forest dead. And this theory is basically saying that Hagrid was only kept alive so that this vision could come to fruition. Now, I do want to point out that there's not really an instance in the book where Hagrid could have died. The only thing I can really think of where it would have been feasible was when the swarm of spiders carries him away from the battle. And you could wonder, like, why didn't they just eat Hagrid? They seem pretty uh, keen to do that in the Half-Blood Prince. And so that's the only time I can think of 
uh, where J.K. Rowling kind of tipped the scales in Hagrid's favor there. But yeah, I think that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. You know, every author has that vision of how they want their series to end, and sometimes they have to tip the scales in that favor so that that it happens. I mean, if you look at, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire, the same thing happens with The Red Wedding. You know, George R. R. Martin really, t- you know, tips the scales away from the Stark so that they can all die at the Red Wedding. So, yeah, it's a very common thing. I don't, I don't think J.K. Rowling should be, you know, villainized too much for that one. Ollivander sells wands at a loss. Uh, this theory is basically just saying that Ollivander's economy here really isn't the best because if you think about it, the amount of work that goes into building a wand from getting its core to the wood and everything else and then fitting everything, that probably costs a lot of money, especially when you think about how like rare unicorn tail hair is, how much a phoenix feather might be, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, heart shooting from a dragon. Those things probably are pretty expensive, and we know they're expensive, at least in one case, because... Uh, Slughorn tells you know Hagrid that they sell for a lot on the black market, um, but so yeah, and he only charges about eleven galleons per wand, so he's probably selling these at a loss. Ollivander's a nice guy though. Maybe he just is so um, in love with the concept of wand lore and wand making. He just does it out of a passion. We all have that job, you know, where you work at uh, for a loss maybe, but you just are really passionate about the work, so you're fine with it. <laughs> Okay, let's get to this one. Snape is Harry's dad. Uh, so I guess this is obviously just saying that Harry would have been Snape's biological son, but that would have meant that Lily and James had sex at some point in their lives, which, I mean, I guess it's not the craziest thing in the world. They were pretty good friends. Maybe they hooked up at some point. Maybe that's why he was so in love with her. Maybe. I, I don't know. I But obviously this isn't true. Harry is a dead ringer for his father, there's no way that James is not Harry's dad, biologically speaking. Uh, it would be kind of funny, though, that if Snape was Harry's dad, that Harry turned out to look exactly like uh, Snape's worst enemy, even though he was his biological son. But no, obviously this is not true. <clears throat> Snape is a vampire. So throughout the book, Snape is described as being very bat-like. He has very uh, shallow skin. He has very long, greasy hair, very tall and lanky, it, it, all very vampiric, you know, character descriptions. But the thing is, you know, we see Snape outside in the sun often, and I don't think that Snape's self-control would have been able to stop him from, you know, killing somebody like Neville, perhaps, by drinking his blood. So no, Snape is not a vampire, but I do see where the comparisons can be made. I just think that Snape is just a creepy character. Or at least that's the uh, the vibe J.K.R. wants us to get out of his description. But yeah, no, he's not a vampire. And finally, closing off this tier, we have no higher or lower wizard education. So, yes and no. There's no, like, you know, university that wizards can go to. Uh, for their higher education and it is pretty much evident that there is no elementary school for wizards because Ron is never mentioned or Malfoy never mentions about going to like an elementary school for wizards or anything however I do want to point out that it is mentioned that certain education fields such as you know being a healer at St. Mungo's or being an or at the ministry they do involve higher wizard educations between classes that they have to take by those institutions tests etc etc so while there's no like official like higher education in the sense like you can't get your master's degree in a certain area you there is a higher level of education that you can take to become more qualified in a certain field and so we climb even further down to tier five uh so a lot of these theories are going to be really harebrained but man looking at the bottom of this tier man i i just don't know how we're going to get through this but let's get into the weeds of things. Rita Skeeter is a trans woman. So the only evidence or theory that I found online about this, because I've never heard this one before, is that when Rita Skeeter is described in Goblet of Fire, uh, she has a lot of cosmetic work done. For example, she has like uh, drawn on eyebrows. She has very masculine hands. Her fingernails are painted very uh, flamboyantly, but they're more akin to like claws or talons. She goes through a lot of work putting her hair together, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess the big theory here is 
she went through all this work to cosmetically change her physical appearance to from a man to a female. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics of this, but I really don't think Jake Carr would put a trans person in her books. So yeah, I just I I don't think this one's true. Sorry. <laughs> Can muggles make potions? So this theory is simply referring to the fact that, for the most part, it seems that potioneering seems to be very easy and something that muggles can do because it seems to be just putting certain ingredients into a basin, putting their fires a certain way, you know, stirring so many times, things that muggles should be able to do. And J.K. Rowling has gone on record saying that while it is true that a muggle could get to the very base level of potion making, there's a certain point where magic has to be involved. And I think you see that, especially when you get to any WT level with potion making, when you have to use certain spells to, you know, decipher what a, for example, what a poison is made out of so that a, a cure can be made, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, muggles can, I believe, I believe, like for example, like Dudley could make a first year potion if he tried. But I don't think that once you get to like maybe third year, fourth year, fifth year, especially sixth year, that a muggle would be able to make a, a potion. Stagnant technology. So this is referring to the fact that in the Harry Potter universe, technology seems to have halted its production right around like the mid 1800s to maybe late 1800s. And this is seen in the fact that, you know, we don't ever see any light bulbs. They use candles for everything. Uh, we don't see any development of any kind of writing device outside of a quill and ink, uh, stuff like that. And that is most likely explained that because it is revealed in Goblet of Fire that technology simply can't work around magical uh, interference. And there's no real point in developing something that, you know, can't work around your most common areas. So, yeah, that kind of explains that away. I do think it's kind of sad, though, that, you know, people like maybe Mr. Weasley uh, kind of be, like, working in, like, R&R to get around that conundrum or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> Madam Pence is Snape's mom. Now, while I don't think this one is true, I did find it kind of fun. So, if you're not familiar, Madam Pence is the librarian at Hogwarts. Now, Snape's mom, her name was Irene Prince, right? So, Madam Pence's full name is Irene Pence. And if you go through the entire, if you kind of rearrange the letters, it actually makes an anagram of I'm a prince. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily true uh, at all because obviously Snape would recognize his mom. But I do think it's a fun little like uh, anagram, you know, just like, you know, the Tom Marvilla Riddle one is I am Lord uh, Voldemort. Uh, it's not outside J.K. Rowling's realm is what I'm trying to say. But I just think with the fact that Snape would have definitely recognized his mom that that's just not true. No Wiccans at Hogwarts. So, yeah, this is referring to the fact that we never see any Wiccans at Hogwarts and the fact that you'd think that there would be at least some uh, there that would, you know, be more into, like, earth magic and stuff like that. Now, we do see in Goblet of Fire at the Quidditch World Cup that there is the, you know, the Wiccans Institute, but it is weird that we never see any, you know, muggle-born students or even pure-blood witches or wizards trying to become Wiccans at Hogwarts, and there's not any kind of class over it described. Um, I think that's just mainly because JK didn't want to get her power system too convoluted with different types of magic and whatnot, and kind of just gave it a nod and gobbled a fire. But I do think it'd be kind of interesting to make maybe like a second-year or third-year student decides, hey, you know, I, you know, I was doing research on this uh, type of magic. I want to learn more and decides to go to the Wiccan Institute instead of Hogwarts. Uh, I think that's very uh, possible. Yeah, I think that would be incredibly likely. A werewolf equals HIV and AIDS. So this is referring to the fact that the condition of being a werewolf is an allegory for HIV and AIDS, which would have been at the forefront of J.K. Rowling and the greater wizarding communities and really muggle communities mind in the early to mid-90s. Um, yeah, so there are definitely a lot of allegories with you know people like Umbridge trying to pass laws to stop people who are werewolves from getting jobs and interacting with them. Very similar things happened during the HIV and AIDS pandemic of the early and mid-90s. Um, and there's a lot of people who don't want to be a near a werewolf because they're afraid of contracting the disease, even though it can only be contracted through a werewolf bite, very similar to HIV and AIDS. 
uh, and how Lupin is portrayed as very uh, poor because of his condition, even though it's not really his fault and he can control it. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of allegory there. And I don't, well, I don't think that J.K. Rowling really made that intentional. I think that the allegory is definitely there, and you can definitely look at it that way. Other unregistered anime guy. So, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly possible. I mean, when you think about it, James, uh, Peter, and Sirius, and then Rita later were all able to become unregistered animagus. And it would make sense that another person would be able to go through the process without the ministry ever really figuring it out. There's no way to track it unless they self-register in the first place. So, yeah, the, the concept is definitely possible. Now, characters who might be unregistered anime guy, uh, I've heard the theory that Snape, you know, turning into a bat would be very possible. It would make sense. He was in the, you know, the Marauders year. He would have probably been able to figure it out just like, you know, the Marauders were, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I just think that while I don't have any idea what any specific character could make, um, become, be, be an unregistered anime guy, I think it's very likely and, and, and almost plausible that there are other ones in the, in the world. The Wands of Azkaban Escapees. Yeah, so it's mentioned in A Word of the Phoenix that, you know, the Azkaban Death Eaters escaped from Azkaban. And, but later on during the battle at the Department of Mysteries, a lot of those escapees, like, you know, Bellatrix, most, most famously, had their wand back. Uh, so that begs the question, how do they do that? Well, I think that the biggest thing you have to realize here is that, for one, I don't think that their wands were the original wands that they had when they entered Azkaban, because I'm pretty sure the Ministry would have broke them in half. I mean, they break your wand in half for getting expelled from the school, let alone being a, you know, world-famous criminal. But I don't think it'd be entirely out of the, you know, realm of possibility for a person to take Polyjuice Potion, go to Ollivander's, get a wand made for them, or have a wand discover them again, it, we do know that more than one wand can choose a wizard, so... Yeah, I think that that's probably what happened. That's the only explanation I have, because Ollivander wasn't kidnapped until after the events of the battle at the department. So, yeah, that's all I have to say about that one. It is an interesting little, maybe maybe minor plot hole, but I think it can be explained away. The effect of breaking the Goblet of Fire's magical binding contract. So yeah, in the Four Champions chapter, it's mentioned that there is a magical contract that binds the contestants and the Triwizard to participate. And, but it's never really mentioned what happens if you were to break it. And there's two common theories. One, it's simply that, that the contestant who refuses to participate would die. Or the more, I think a more interesting theory is that if the magical contract is null and void, then the Triwizard Tournament itself is null and void. Meaning, for example, let's say Harry did not sit for the three events, right? So, uh, Fleur, Crumb, and Cedric all participate in the three events, but then those three events didn't count because all four champions did not participate, meaning that even though there might be a crown winner, the tournament would still be technically, quote-unquote, going on, and if an event isn't taking place, everybody would die, or every, every single one of them would die. That is my personal take on it. I think that's a lot more darker and a lot more consequential, and I think that just makes a lot more... Not necessarily more sense, but I think it just it fits the pattern more, if that makes sense. So, yeah, um, that's all I have to say about that one. Let me know what you think down below about that one and your theories about breaking the magical contract. Because it's literally never referenced. But that's my personal theory. Bill and Percy had time turners. So yeah, this is a very popular theory that Hermione was not the very first student to ever get a time turner in order for her to keep up with the classes. It's mentioned in Chamber of Secrets that Percy got a ton of owls in uh, his fifth year, but for that to be possible, he would have had to have a, had a time turner for it to make sense, and Bill's the same way. Uh, yeah, I personally believe this one to be true, because for Hermione to be the first one to ever get a time turner from the Ministry in order for her to go to classes is kind of like... It puts too much emphasis on Hermione. I think that there should be some kind of precedent for uh, their, for other students that have time turners, and I think that makes the most sense. Mr. Granger saving baby Harry. 
Right. So this is actually a abandoned plot line that J.K. Rowling had thought up at one point. So this is actually very interesting. So as we all know, Voldemort shows up at the Potter's residence in Godric's Hollow and to kill the Potters, right? Well, when the curse backfires on Harry and hits Voldemort, there's a giant explosion. And this is where things kind of deviate from the what actually happened in the books. So originally, the Grangers, Mr. and Mrs. Granger, were supposed to be vacationing with the baby Hermione near Godric's Hollow on a shoreline, right? Well, the Grangers are supposed to have seen the explosion at the house from a distance away. Mr. Granger, you know, leaves his wife and uh, newborn daughter to go, you know, investigate what the explosion was. And he arrives at the rubble that is now the Potter's house. He sees baby Harry and he kind of takes care of it until Hagrid shows up. Because if you think about the timeline here, uh, Hagrid could have, there's no reason for Hagrid to have taken so long to pick up baby Harry. Uh, basically, he almost had almost 36 hours between the events of, you know, Voldemort uh, being blown up and him arriving at Privet Drive. So, how did Harry survive in the rubble for almost 36 hours? Well, this explanation is that Mr. Granger went in and saved baby Harry and was taking care of him until, you know, Hagrid showed up and said that the kid is mine, I am its next of kin or whatever, and he go and Mr. Granger relieves himself of baby Harry. Um, I think that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the in the grand scheme of things because that, kind of, again, puts too much of a... Uh, coincidence that you know Mr. Granger Hermione's parents saved baby Harry and then Hermione and Harry become best friends later that is a huge coincidence but I do like that it kind of explains the way the time jump between um, Hagrid picking up baby Harry and him arriving at Perfect Drive I do think that that kind of would explain that away and it makes sense about why it wasn't later <laughs> That shows at the end of Goblet of Fire. This is another plot hole that a lot of people go back and realize doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So at the end of every school year, the carriages, you know, take the students back to the Hogwarts Express to go home. And as we learn in Order of the Phoenix, these uh, carriages are actually pulled by Thestrals. Well, if that's the case, then why didn't Harry see the Thestrals at the very end of the book? Well, honestly, that's kind of explained away by J.K. Rowling, by, him, by her saying that Harry hadn't processed Cedric's death. But unfortunately, that's probably just a weak explanation. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a plot hole. I can't really explain this one this one away more than JKR already has. But yeah. Harry saw Regulus in the cave. So yeah, at the end of Half Blood Prince, when Harry and Dumbledore are fighting out the army of Inferi, this theory is saying that one of those Inferi would have had to have been Regulus. And yeah, most likely. Um, my only problem with it is that there has to be a charm placed on a dead body for that body to become an inferi. And we have no indication that Voldemort would have gone back to the cave after Regulus's death to put a charm on him. Maybe he does it every now and again. Maybe he just does it when he goes to visit the Horcruxes to make sure they're safe. Maybe he just, as an afterthought, places a general inferi curse over the entire lake. Um, that's the only way I can see this not being true. Um, I do think it'd be very tragic, though, that at the end of Order of the Phoenix, you know, Harry sees Sirius die, and then at the end of Order of Half Blood Prince, he um, has to fight off his brother. Um, I think that'd be very thematic. But again, I stated the problems with it beforehand. But I think that thematically, I wouldn't be against it if it turned out to be true. <laughs> The Dursley Christmas presents foreshadow the Deathly Hallows. So this is saying that, you know, in the very early books, the Dursleys very often give Harry gifts for Christmas, but they're usually about nothing, right? Uh, they, they don't equate to much. But this theory says that they actually foreshadow the Deathly Hallows. So Harry at one point gets the 50 pence uh, coin, basically, from the Dursleys. And this is supposedly supposed to foreshadow the Resurrection Stone. He later gets a toothpick for Christmas one year, which is to represent the Elder Wand. And then he gets a, a tissue, which is supposed to represent the uh, Invisibility Cloak. Uh, I don't think this is true. I think this is just you know fans reading into things that aren't there anymore. But I, I wouldn't be opposed to it being like a thematic thing. Maybe it's like a uh, subconscious thing that J.K. Rowling put in to give us an idea of what these Hallows could be or very early in the books. 
uh, I think it's not true at all, but yeah, I, I don't mind it, I guess. Did Lavender die? So, in the books, no. In the movies, yes, is the best way I can think about it. So, in the uh, movies, Lavender Brown is killed by Fenrir Greyback during the Battle of Hogwarts. And in the books, is very a very similar event happens where the trio are running through the school to get to the Shrieking Shack. And they see that Lavender is being attacked by Fenrir Greyback. And Hermione saves her. Uh, I suppose we never actually do see Lavender ever again in the books, and it's very possible that she could have died. Maybe Fenrir got to her too soon, and she bled out. Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, I like to think that she survived, though, for one reason and one reason only, and that is Hermione saved her. Uh, Hermione and Lavender obviously had that feud because they both uh, had a crush on Ron, on Ron during Half-Blood Prince, and I think it's thematic that Hermione is the one that saves her. But yeah, I don't think that she died in the books, but if you, if you know, if on Pottermore, if it comes out that, yeah, she actually died in, you know, the battle, I could understand why it happened that way. Owl tracking magic. So yeah, this is referring to the fact that, you know, it's very weird that owls can track down people that their letters are meant for. You know, this is most common in the fact that, you know, Hedwig is able to find Sirius when he's apparently maybe in, like, some kind of southern climate, like South America, maybe uh, some part of Africa, perhaps, or maybe southern Europe. Either way, Harry has no idea where Sirius is, but Hedwig is able to find him. And that raises the question of how is that possible? And for that matter, how does, you know, Hedwig know where the burrow is? How does she know where, you know, the, the uh, Grimwald, Grimwald place is, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and this goes back to uh, magic at the end of the day. I think the magical bird, they're magical birds. They, I mean, they're actually owls, but they are bred to have some kind of magical property that gives them the ability to track down certain individuals. Okay, so this next one, I have scoured every part of the internet that I can look for. I have thought about every single time that it could have happened. I have literally have no idea. But it's the theory that Umbridge drugged Harry, not just with Veritaserum. So we know that Umbridge at least attempted to give Harry Veritaserum when she became headmistress. And I, but I really I can't think of any other instance where she would have had the opportunity to poison him. Um, I, n- none of the times when she was in his office during detention, that, that couldn't have worked. None of the classroom scenes, none of the times when they were uh, fighting each other. I, I can't think of any opportunity that Umbridge would have had to have drugged Harry. Let me know down below if you know what this one is referring to because I, for the life of me, I cannot figure this one out. Dumbledore uses Peeves and Portraits to spy. So there's been a big question for a while about why Dumbledore allows Peeves to stay at the school. And my personal theory is Dumbledore just thinks that Peeves adds a little bit of humor and kind of the wit of the school to remain there. But we do know for a fact that Dumbledore does use the portraits to spy, at least on one occasion. He uses them in order of the Phoenix to go spy on the Ministry while during the attack of Arthur Weasley. Uh, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that he would also use them to spy on the goings-on around the school. Uh, he does seem to be all-knowing a lot of the times, and you have to question how he does that. And we do know that Pease in particular has a lot of, not necessarily respect, maybe just fear of Dumbledore. Because during the events of uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, when the only time that Dumbledore and Peeves ever speak, Peeves gets very, very oily and very, very respectful towards Dumbledore. So it's possible that Dumbledore uses Peeves to spy, and Peeves is more than happy to do it. So uh, I think that it's very, very likely he uses the portraits, and I'd say it's about a 50 50 shot that he uses Peeves. Most wizards work for the government. Uh, yeah, this is simply just saying the fact that within the wizarding world, there aren't a whole lot of jobs. During the uh, career advice chapter, we do see that there are other jobs outside the ministry. For example, you can work for St. Mungo's, you can work for the Gringotts Bank. But other than really those two instances, pretty much every other job is at the ministry itself. And you kind of have to think that maybe, if you want to get conspiratorial, you can think that maybe the government is set up that way. So that the ministry has almost absolute control over, you know, the livelihood of so many of their residents. 
Uh, that's kind of tinfoil I I want to put it past it because the ministry is very corrupt. It wasn't just Cornelius Fudge who was corrupt in the in, you know, in the past. But I think that's just because you know, magic can do a lot of jobs that we in the muggle world would find so menial that they don't even need to employ people to do it. You know, like paving and whatnot and, you know, trash pickup and dentistry, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think that that's all this one is referring to. Uh, that's all I have to say about it, but I, I like that tinfoil theory I just came up with. Snape and or Sirius died virgins. So yeah, this is basically just saying that, you know, Snape and Sirius were never in any, in any kind of romantic relationship and it's likely that they died without ever having sex. Now for the serious one, I almost want to doubt that one for one reason, one reason only, and that is he had no issue uh, picking up girls in the uh, Snape's worst memory chapter, it is stated multiple times that they're the girls all around Sirius are more than happy to fawn over him. And I think that you know, a teenage boy, even if he wanted to experiment, you know, him having that much control over women probably would have done so. Snape, uh, if you want to go back to the theory that him and Lily had hooked up and that's why he's so obsessed o- over her, then you can say that's not true, but. Uh, if you want to get more romantic, you can say that Snape refused to have relationships with any other woman because he was so in love with Lily. Uh, that fits into the character more, in my opinion. But, yeah. Uh, did they die virgins? Uh, Sirius, probably not. Snape, maybe, depending on how you look at the, at the situation. The centaurs misinterpreted the date of Harry's death in the forest. So yeah, this is one is simply saying that back in the Philosopher's Stone, it's mentioned that the centaurs had predicted Harry's death in the forest by Voldemort's hands. And this theory is stating that while they weren't wrong, they just simply misinterpreted the date by a couple of years. Because Harry does end up dying in the forest by, by Voldemort's hand come the event of Book 7. Uh, I think that, that this one is very accurate. Um, we know from Ferenzi's lessons in Order of the Phoenix that divination is a very imprecise form of magic to the centaurs. They don't ever claim to get anything exactly right. Um, and I think that kind of fits in with their methodology a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I like that theory a lot. I think that it's more likely that instead of, you know, Ferenzi preventing Harry's death, the centaurs were simply wrong about the date it was supposed to happen. Pandora Lovegood's death. So Pandora Lovegood, if you're not familiar, is Luna's mother who passed away when she was little. Uh, so there has been a lot of theories about what actually happened to Pandora Lovegood. Um, we know that she died from experimenting with magic in some way or shape or form, but we just don't know the details. Uh, one very popular theory is that Pandora had a condition very similar to, to Nagini, and that she was going to turn into a magical animal at some point, and she was experimenting with magic in order to prevent that. Um, I I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, because there's not any textual evidence, but I just think that it would be even more tragic if that was the case. Um, but I also like to think that, you know, the reason Xenophilius fell in love with Pandora was because of her willingness to experiment and be more open to things that most people aren't and that led her down the path of dying one day unfortunately uh either way the love good family is my personal favorite family in the entire book series so i could probably talk about them at length i might even do an entire video about the love goods one day but i i just really um feel for pandora love good and luna who lost her mom so young Prince Frederick and King George III. So this can mean one of two things. This can either be referring to the fact that Fred and George Weasley are named after, you know, royalty, but so are the the entire Weasley family is named after royalty, either fictional or otherwise, in some way. Uh, or it could be referring to the fact that in the canon of Harry Potter, King George III knew about Wizards Kind, and towards the end of his life, he was suffering from a, a severe illness, and he reached out to the Minister of Magic for help. But unfortunately, this led to the people of um, uh, his kingdom to feel that he was believing in witchcraft, which gave him a vote of confidence, and he was revoked from his crown. Uh, I, I personally probably think that this is probably just referring to the fact that Fred and George are named after these two royalty lines. 
But uh, I did find that King George and it would be kind of interesting. The Hogwarts toilets flush into the lake. Again, I feel like this one should be high up on the iceberg because it is confirmed in Goblet of Fire that they do, in fact, flush into the lake. We know this because Modi Myrtle is flushed into the lake multiple times and that she often just swims down there uh, on accident. Um, I don't really know what else to say about that one. Maybe Harry should have seen some kind of toilet content in the lake when he was down there during the second task, maybe, um, if you want to go down that route, but... I don't know why this one isn't high on the iceberg. I, I don't have much to say about it. Hit Wizards. So this is referring to the fact that in The Prisoner of Azkaban, when Cornelius Fudge is describing the supposed story about Sirius Black, uh, he says that only trained Hit Wizards could have taken out such a powerful wizard. The, uh, the problem with this, though, is that Hit Wizards are never mentioned again, and they're replaced with the concept of ores come a gobble to fire. Uh, I mean, I think that's just because the term hit wizard is kind of wordy and J.K. Rowling decided to give a better word for it in the sense of or. Uh, but maybe if you want to go down a hypothetical here, you could say that maybe there are people in the or office who are specifically trained to take out bounties on people. Maybe there are, there's an entire sub industry in the wizarding world of people who train to take out, uh, powerful people for bounties that the ministry sets up. Maybe uh, in the Second Wizarding War, maybe that there was a subsection of the wizarding population who were training to become hit wizards to, to collect the bounty on Voldemort and other powerful Death Eaters. Uh, maybe that's kind of fan fiction-y, uh, but I don't know. I like it. Sorcerer's Stone, Hagrid Flying. So this is referring to the fact that when Hagrid goes to pick up the... Uh, the trio of Hermione, Harry, and Draco for their detention. Hagrid mentions that he was already in the forest and that he flew back to pick them up. Uh, but the problem with this is Hagrid later mentions on in Order of the Phoenix that brooms can't really fit his, you know, his weight. Uh, and so that raises the question, how did Hagrid fly back, you know, to the, to the hut from the, from the forest? Uh, most likely Thestrals, um, I believe. Thestrals make the most sense. They might be able to support his weight. They are horses. They're pretty powerful. Uh, yeah, there's not really a whole lot of explanation for that one. Uh, it's probably just a plot hole, honestly. But if you're going to put a theory on it, he used Thestral as the fly back from the forest because he keeps him in the forest to pick up the uh, trio for their detention. And yeah. Hermione almost transferred the Bobatons. So this theory is stating that Hermione perhaps uh, may be unsatisfied with her education at Hogwarts or maybe after being petrified she was scared to go back to the school. She was debating on transferring to the French school. And the evidence for that is in the summer between uh, Chamber and Prisoner, Hermione is mentioned of going on vacation to France. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it doesn't not surprise me that Hermione would go out of her way to investigate other educational methods or departments uh, where she might feel she can get a better education. And once she went there to investigate Bobaton, she realized it wasn't much different than Hogwarts itself. And she had made such good friends at Hogwarts and Harry and Ron that she had decided it wasn't worth the maybe equal or maybe just slightly better education that the French school offered. Uh, I like that theory a lot. It does give kind of context to her vacationing randomly in France of all places. But yeah, um, I, tell me what you think down below about that one. That's kind of interesting. Man, I'm looking at tier six, seven, and eight, and I really don't know how I'm going to make some of this kind of interesting or YouTube friendly, but we're going to try our best. So, yeah, the first Wizarding War shrunk Harry's class size. Uh, this is basically saying that for such a big school, Harry's class size is very small. And, you know, the years above him, such as Fred and George and Percy's year, are also kind of small if you look at uh, who's mentioned. So uh, this is basically saying because when Harry was born in the years leading up to his birth, the magical w uh, world was under siege by Voldemort. People were either choosing not to have children or Voldemort was killing off so many people that they weren't able to have children. And yeah, I would, I honestly put this one in either tier four or five. I think it's very, very, very likely that that's the case. 
uh, and it kind of just adds more of a man. Voldemort really, really was terrifying to the magical community when you realize that people were either too scared to have children or that they were literally dying in such a massive ways that they weren't able to. Dumbledore wasn't buried with the real Elder Wand. So this theory has a lot of facets, so let's go into kind of a timeline here. So we know Draco disarms Dumbledore, who had the Elder Wand. Snape kills Dumbledore. Dumbledore's body is blown backwards. They find the Elder Wand next to Dumbledore's body a few feet away. Dumbledore is apparently buried with the Elder Wand. Voldemort takes possession of it physically from Dumbledore's tomb. Unbeknownst to him, Draco had actually became the master of the Elder Wand. Harry defeats Draco, making him the true master over the wand, meaning that Harry now has in p effectively possession of all three hollows, meaning making him the master of death. This theory states, however, that Dumbledore was kind of worried that his plan was not infallible and wanted some kind of backup just in case. So this theory says that Dumbledore instructed Snape to go down to his tomb and switch out the wands. Just in case that Voldemort somehow did become master of the Elder Wand, he would not have physical possession of it. The problem with this theory, though, is that um, Harry has to become the master of death somehow, right? He has to be able to possess all three of the, of the Deathly Hallows at some point or another, right? But actually, if you think about it, maybe Dumbledore's death actually just ended the entire binding contract of the Elder Wand, so to speak. Maybe with... Harry disarming Draco that ended everything because Harry did not kill Draco. Draco never dies. And because that was the last time the elder one switched possession that ended the entire, uh, the way the transference process of the elder wand. Uh, so maybe, uh, Harry was able to defeat Voldemort just because he was the true master of the elder wand, but because Voldemort was not, uh, Harry simply was able to overpower him with, the magical protection he had given himself, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I like that theory a lot. Um, it makes a lot of... Uh, okay, I, I, let me rephrase it. I don't like the theory a lot. I think you have to jump through some hoops in order for Harry to get into possession of the Elder Wand. I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense how he was able to fix his own wand without it. But, yeah, that's my, um, my, my theory and concept of it. Let me know down below what you think about that one. This one has a lot of facets to it that I didn't go into. Uh, but, yeah... Arthur Weasley is a chubby chaser. I'm not going to spend long on this one, but the evidence is, for one, Mrs. Weasley is described as being very stout, but very pretty. And in Half-Blood Prince, when they're going over what, you know, what, what Molly likes to be called by Arthur, he says Molly Wobbles, implying that he likes a little bit extra meat on his wife's skin. You know how it goes. I'm not spending time on this one, sorry. <laughs> Lily's screaming is Voldemort's memory, not Harry's. So yeah, in Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry was reliving the death of his mother by hearing her scream when Voldemort comes to the house to kill them, right? Um, so this theory is basically saying that what is actually happening is the part of Harry that is Voldemort is actually remembering Lily's screaming. And I guess that makes sense. Just because, you know, Harry was such a baby, how would he have any kind of memory, whether it be suppressed or not of his mother screaming you know and we do see later on in the chapter in deathly hallows where we see the death of the potters from Voldemort's point of view um and that kind of lines up so yeah i think that makes a lot of sense i'm going to put that down as probably like a 75 percent true theory Moaning Myrtle had info about the Chamber of Secrets and the Basilisk. So, in the context of Chamber of Secrets, we know that Myrtle uh, had been killed by the Basilisk, and all she remembers is seeing a bright yellow eye right before her death, right? Uh, but this theory goes on to say that maybe Myrtle had actually figured out more about the Chamber and the Basilisk and was simply not telling anybody or was too scared to tell anybody, etc. Uh, it's possible, as a ghost, she would have figured it out. I mean, she could simply just go through the uh, pipeline and get down to the chamber. Uh, she could have figured out about the basilisk from some other source throughout her many you know, 50 years of being dead. Um, it makes a lot of sense for her to have some information that she just simply didn't tell anybody about, or I just didn't think it was relevant. 
maybe she thought everybody knew about the chamber and simply just didn't think it was any, any information worth telling. Um, I think it makes sense for her to have at least some level of information about it, but I don't think that she had specific details like about the basilisk. Inventing spells. Uh, this is actually an interesting concept because we know that, you know, Severus Snape was able to invent spells uh, during his time at Hogwarts. And we never really get the process of how spell inventing is done. Uh, my biggest guess is you have to use some form of uh, language, such as Latin, to give the spell the intent. And then you have to put magical intent behind that force. And then you get some kind of effect and then you kind of tweak it until it gets to what you want. Um, that makes the most sense to me. Honestly, for Snape being 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, when he was inventing spells is extremely impressive and it doesn't get talked about enough about how good of a wizard he was. Harry forfeited his gold when he broke into Gringotts. So this theory is stating that because Gringotts is not a ministry-affiliated entity, that when Harry broke into the Wizarding Bank, the Gringotts was able to seal up his vault, and he was never able to get back inside of it again. Um, I mean, it makes sense. Harry did put an unforgivable curse on a number of employees that worked there. Even though Harry was doing it to save the Wizarding World, the goblins are not known for their charity in these situations. Um, I would like to think that somebody, maybe Bill, maybe was able to come in on Harry's side and maybe, uh, you know, talk the wizards, uh, talk the goblins out of doing that. But honestly, I can see the goblins being vindictive about that and forfeiting Harry's gold. The high number of pro Quidditch players. So if you look at how many pro Quidditch teams there are, there's basically one for every country, um, in Europe at least. And it kind of is weird that there are that many you know, pro Quidditch players or people that are that good to play professionally. When you think about how much training Harry goes through, how much um, these other schools go through, and we never get mentioned that Durmstrang or Bobatons have any kind of Quidditch league of their own. So is Hogwarts the only place where you can get knowledge of how to play Quidditch? And even then, that only leaves 28 players to be able to graduate uh, per year at most uh, from Hogwarts to go on to the Pro League. So it doesn't really make sense for them to be that number of high number of Quidditch players. <sighs> Polyjuice Potion Sex. So, Polyjuice Potion sex, uh, the problem with it is we don't know if the Polyjuice Potion actually alters you genetically or if it's just a cosmetic thing. So, the theory here goes, you know, so, for example, what would have happened if, um, for example, I don't know, maybe Lupin transforms into Harry during the Seven Potters chapter, he has sex with Tonks, and that baby... Does that baby now, is he part Lupin, is it a part Harry? Uh, we don't have an answer for this. Honestly, I don't know why anybody thinks about these things. But there you have it. Um, the Polyjuice Potion sex thing, I guess it's interesting biologically and magically speaking, but I don't want to get too much into that one. The house elves are too powerful. Um, I don't know about too powerful, but I think it is very underestimated how powerful house elves truly are. We see that Dobby is able to knock back, you know, Lucius Malfoy. He's able to basically take down an entire room of Death Eaters in Malfoy's manner. We see that, you know, a uh, creature is able to apparate in and out of the cave, which was a spell put on it by Voldemort himself. We see that creature and Dobby are able to apparate in and out of Hogwarts when Hogwarts has one of the most magical protections in the entire, you know, world. So the fact that house elves are so powerful is interesting. I wouldn't say they're too powerful because they are restricted by their magical contract to their by to their masters. But I do think it's interesting to look at that and say, you know, if Hermione does end up freeing the house elves later on in her career, um, how that would be in terms of um, power scaling, I guess, in the wizarding world. The Hermione and Bellatrix extended torture scene in the movies. 
So yeah, if you're not, if you're not aware, um, the torture scene between Hermione and Bellatrix is actually one of the best acted scenes in all the movies. Uh, there was a point when they had to halt the production because uh, Emma Watson, who was obviously playing Hermione, was screaming so realistically. They thought that the uh, actress who plays Bellatrix, Helena, had actually unknowingly hurt her, and that there was uh, you know concern with Emma's well being. Uh, and this is actually another part what that most people don't know is that that scene was actually extended where we see Bellatrix actually carving the word my blood into Hermione's arm. We see extended use of the Cruciatus curse. We see her throwing uh, Hermione around. It's a very brutal scene and it's acted almost beautifully um, just because how good of an actress Emma Watson is. And if, you, if you're curious, um, when the production stopped on the torture scene, and they stopped uh, and asked Emma if she was okay. Emma Watson told them, "Like, hurry up and let's get back to it. I, I'm in the zone, guys. I need to, I need to get this one out." <laughs> Mad Eye's eye can see through the invisibility cloak. So yeah, we know that Moody's eye can undeniably see through an invisibility cloak. The problem is he sees through Harry's invisibility cloak. And unfortunately, the invisibility cloak is one of the Deathly Hallows, meaning that it's one of the most powerful magical objects in the world. So how does an eye that, granted, can see through things, how is it able to see through Harry's? Uh, well, honestly, it's a plot hole, I think. I don't think that JK had really thought of about the invis invisibility cloak itself being a hallow yet. Um, but unfortunately, that means that we have to now contest with the idea that Moody's eye is so powerful that it's on the same level of the hallows, which... I don't think it was the intent, but there you have it. Voldemort hesitated before killing Lily. Yeah, so in the in the chapter where we see the death of the Potters from po Voldemort's point of view, we see that Voldemort had actually tried to not kill Lily. This is because Snape had specifically asked him not to, and Snape was one of his most loyal servants. And it's kind of interesting that Voldemort would have taken that into consideration when he was going on his his murder spree at the Potter's house. But yeah, it's definitely true. Voldemort hesitated before killing Lily. He told her to step aside. It didn't have to be this way, but Lily refused so that she could protect Harry. And Voldemort decides that it's not worth the um, not worth the fight, really, I guess, and decides to kill her flat out and decides to tell Snape that, you know, it can be a different, it, that it just turned out differently. Voldemort doesn't care about blood purity. Yeah, I think this is kind of true. Now, I think Tom Riddle killed, cared about blood purity when he was at Hogwarts because he was using the uh, Chamber of Secrets and the Weapon of Slytherin to take out Muggleborns. But I think as Voldemort got, you know, later on in his life, he stopped really caring all that much about blood purity and was more in it for himself. And the blood purity stigma was just something he could get people to rally behind. And I think that makes a lot of sense because you don't really ever see Voldemort himself talk about blood purity. He doesn't talk about um, anything that is really all that prejudiced against Muggleborns, other, but he does use it as a rallying point for his Death Eaters. Now, I think it's kind of interesting that uh, leading up to the Battle of Hogwarts, Voldemort even says he does not wish to spill magical blood. He doesn't say pure blood. He doesn't say anything that. He says magical blood. So I think I think towards you know later in his life he realized that he doesn't really care one way or the other about Muggleborns, but he just needed something for them to rally behind. The house elves are brainwashed. So I don't want to get into the house elf discussion too much here because it's very 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 complicated. So on one hand, you could say that house elves are magical creatures. They are literally programmed from birth by their magic to want to work and serve their masters. You look at someone like Dobby, who even Dobby was not a big fan of the Malfoys, but in Goblet of Fire, he does say he likes working. He likes working for Dumbledore. He just wanted to be able to choose his master. But on the other hand, you could say that maybe the house elves were simply brainwashed into this societal structure, and that's why they act the way they do. It's a complicated discussion that goes into societal structure and whatnot, but I think that my personal view on it is that 
House elves are magical creatures and their magic makes them want to work. But I think that there are some like Dobby who uh, are able to not necessarily get around their magical prowess, but are more open to more liberal ideas when it comes to it. Muggles derive the term abracadabra from Avada Kedavra. Yeah, I think that that's most likely what happened. And honestly, the, the reason I, I fit this into the canon of the story is because Avada Kedavra actually means to bring death. It doesn't actually have anything related to abracadabra, even though a lot of people seem to think that it does. Um, but yeah, I think that Muggles could have heard the term abracadabra during... Uh, when wizards were more open about their magicalness and they saw how powerful it was and they decided to make a- Avada Kedavra theirs and throughout the, you know, the history of the world it just morphed into Avada Kedavra and that's where the muggles get that concept from. Okay, I guess we had to get to this one at some point. Hagrid's conception. Uh, yeah, so how did Hagrid's dad have sex with a giant? Um, that's that's the big question. Uh, how did that work? Um, why did a giant consent to that? How did it happen? I don't even want to get into the logistics of it. Man must have been swimming. I, I don't. I really don't know. Um, I just, I, uh, I don't know. And I don't want to think about it, but... Uh, there are a lot of fan art theories if you want to go on Reddit or Tumblr or Pinterest and you can you can you can look through that all all you want I I promise Crab destroyed the rumor requirement is going to round off tier 6 Yeah I honestly believe the rumor requirement was never able to be used again after the events of the battle of Hogwarts chapter uh, that's because Fiendfire, which is what Crab used to attack uh, the Golden Trio, uh, is described to not be able to be quenched. It destroys even Horcruxes. And I just don't think that the magical room of requirement, which is very magically powerful, I don't think it's as magically powerful as a Horcrux. And if a Horcrux can be destroyed by Fiendfire, I don't understand why the room of requirement wouldn't be able to. It's really sad that the room of requirement it would have, you know, died that way. But I think that it's just one of those other casualties that Hogwarts sustained after the war was over. Okay, and we're into Tier 7. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get into these darker theories, these more elusive theories. And let's start that off with, oh boy. Dumbledore is evil. Okay, so yeah, let's look at the actions of Dumbledore in this in these books. He allows Harry to be abused by the Dursleys till the age of 11. He uh, has an idea about, you know, who opened the Chamber of Secrets. He just doesn't know how. He has the idea that Quirrell is actually being possessed by uh, Voldemort. Uh, he has the idea of allowing Harry to work through the um, trials at the Triwizard Tournament, when I'm pretty sure he could have. He basically, you know, ostracizes himself from Harry. Uh, he himself admits to the fact that, that um, he was the reason that Sirius died. He keeps a lot of secrets from Harry and the Half-Blood Prince, and his chest piecing of the Deathly Hallows is extremely, if not evil, it's at least dubious, right? So let's get into if Dumbledore was actually evil. Like I said, I can't spend too long on this because this video is already probably over two hours. But yeah, Dumbledore, is. if he's not evil, he's at least dubious. He, you know, he allowed Saint to die for him. He uh, manipulated Snape through Snape's love for Lily. Sn- Dumbledore might not be evil, but you cannot deny that some of the things he did was not conniving in its own right. Plus, you go into the whole concept of him and Grindelwald and their um, wanting to expand out into their theory about how wizards were better than muggles. It's not looking good for the man. I don't think he, he was evil. I just think he was conniving. <laughs> Human workers and guards at Azkaban. Right, so this goes into what if people were working at Azkaban, and you can do it kind of in two time frames, whether people were there when the Dementors were there or when people were not, right? Uh, I don't think that any human could work at Azkaban while the Dementors were there without, you know, going insane, just like the prisoners do. 
but that does raise the question, are Dementors able to, you know, open up doors? Are they able to communicate with ministry employees? Are they able to, you know, slide food into the prisoners? Or how are they able to carry um, Barty, Barty Crouch Jr.'s uh, mother disguised as himself out to bury him? Are they able to carry shovels, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? That just kind of lay into that. But we do know after the Second Wizarding War, when Kingsley Shacklebolt becomes... The minister, he does exile all of the Dementors away and puts human workers and guards at the Askman instead of the Dementors. So yeah, we know it does happen eventually. It's just contested about when it happens. The snitches are more willing to be seen by a losing team seeker. Uh, yeah, so there is some context to this. I mean, most of the time when... Harry catches a snitch. They're usually down points at some point, or at least tied. And that's when Harry goes off to catch a snitch. Uh, realistically, I think it's more that, Harry, that uh, J.K. Rowling is trying to give Harry uh, his, you know, underdog moments in the, in the stories. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a magic spell on the snitch that allowed it to be seen by the losing team seeker, just to add to more of a um, excitement in the game, so to speak. I think that really does make a lot of sense at least in the terms of maybe at hogwarts that's on that's on there maybe professionally maybe it isn't but let me know what you guys think about that one down below the ministry is a dictatorship so yeah this goes into how obvious it is that the ministry is obviously corrupt and not a lot of people do anything about it and it's more of a figurehead of a minister of magic than it is anything else uh you can kind of look at that when you look at how easily voldemort was able to change laws inside the ministry once he took over in deathly hallows you would think that there would be at least some kind of legislation uh that he would have had to either a manipulate b get rid of or c just you know ignore but it's never mentioned about how he got these laws passed. Um, when you look at the events of Order of the Phoenix, how easily uh, you know um, Cornelius Fudge was able to manipulate the media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I don't. I think that maybe the term dictatorship maybe isn't the right word for it, but it's definitely more of an authoritarian, total, total totalitarian government system. And yeah, you just look at these things and you wonder, you know, how did they come to be without? some kind of tricks and balances. Harry is immortal. So it's stated in the tale of the three brothers that any person who possesses all three of the Deathly Hallows uh, cannot die. They become the master of death or the conqueror of death, etc. depending on what verbiage you look at and what story you're listening to. So this has led to the theory that Harry uh, is immortal, which is kind of sad when you realize that he'll outlive his wife, his best friends, and maybe even his children. Uh, so here's my problem with it. If that was the case, then Dumbledore should not have been able to die. If it is true that any person who ever possessed any of the three, or all three of the Deathly Hallows is immortal, then Dumbledore should not have been able to die because at one point in his life, he did possess all three. Now... With that being said, I think it's possible that if you possess all three on your person at the same time, then yes, you may be, become immortal. You are the master of death. But honestly, Harry never has all three of the Deathly Hallows at any given point. He has the cloak and the stone for the majority of the of Book 7, but he drops the stone uh, when he walks into the forest, and then when he conquers the wand back from Voldemort, he doesn't have the stone, and he leaves the wand inside the desk at... Dumbledore's office so I just I don't think that that would make sense for him to be immoral McGonagall is a death eater theory okay this actually has a lot more evidence than I originally thought before I researched it but let's get into it so I know what you're thinking McGonagall is a very sweet lady she protects Harry and the gang multiple times throughout the entire series but uh, let's get into the evidence so the very first real evidence that we see is that in Philosopher's Stone, McGonagall shows up to receive um, Harry, and Dumbledore questions why she's there in the first place, and it could be that she was hoping that she would intercept Hagrid before Dumbledore showed up in order to kill baby Harry, right? That's circumstantial at best, but it is kind of weird that McGonagall knew where Harry was going to be dropped off at before it happens, right? Then we move on into Chamber of Secrets, right? So McGonagall would have been a student at Hogwarts around the same time 
that Voldemort was at school, right? Uh, so why doesn't she ever offer up anything in regards to the chamber? She could at the very least have said something to the effect of maybe it's not going to be as bad as last time. Oh no, not again. Uh, she doesn't really react at all to the chamber, right? So this theory goes on to state that in Chamber of Secrets, she was actually in league with Lucius Malfoy because what she would get out of it is Mal is Dumbledore being uh, suspended as headmaster and she would come in as the backup as deputy headmistress, right? So that gives her come some kind of power. And then the last piece of evidence inside of the Chamber of Secrets is when Harry, Ron, and Ginny and Lockhart come back up to the office, uh, McGonagall is extremely surprised that they're all back alive, right? Moving past uh, order, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, because there's not really a whole lot that goes on there, we move on to Goblet of Fire, right? So when they're all debating whether or not uh, Harry should participate inside of the tournament. McGonagall is noted as being present at these uh, debates, but she does not ever actually offer anything to say that Harry shouldn't participate, right? Uh, it, and it's kind of weird that she's even there in the first place because, yes, she's Harry's head of house, but what does that have to do with him, you know, participating in the, um, in the Triwizard, right? Um, not only that, there's that instance when she... Uh, is set to guard Barty Crouch Jr. And she somehow allowed the Minister of Magic and the Dementors to come in and suck out his soul, which would have been incriminating evidence that Voldemort had returned. Uh, there, there is a whole lot under this. Um, then we move on to Order of the Phoenix. In Order of the Phoenix, you have to question whether or not uh, McGonagall actually does anything for the Order. So we know that there are professors who work in two terms of being at the Order and at Hogwarts, Snape and McGonagall being the most obvious, right? Well, we know what Snape's up to during his terms as, as a member of the Order of the Phoenix, but what is McGonagall really up to? It's never revealed. The most you can assume is maybe she's doing guard duty of some sort. And then you move on to the scene where Hagrid is uh, being attacked by Umbridge, right? Now, I do want to point out, we can't really deny the fact that McGonagall hates Umbridge. But I think that, if you want to believe this theory, that might actually have more to do with the fact that uh, Umbridge was undermining um, her role of coming over as headmistress if Dumbledore were to walk away from the seat of power, right? It was kind of like a power balance thing that had gone off. Um, so, yeah, anyway, move on to the scene where... Hagrid is being attacked by Umbridge, and McGonagall goes out to go help, right? Now, you might say that, you know, McGonagall is trying her hardest to protect her friend, but if you think about it, why would she risk losing, being lost at Hogwarts when she knows that uh, Dumbledore is gone, she knows that Snape uh, has to keep allegiances to Voldemort, and she knows that Hagrid's on thin ice. She's the last member of the Order of the Phoenix that can help out in case anything happened, wouldn't Dumbledore will want there to be someone there that can protect the school, you know, and then you, uh, that's kind of weird. And then you move on to, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a long one. You move on to Half-Blood Prince where she gives an alibi for Draco having the necklace, right? Uh, which is really weird. Why, why would she do that? I mean, you could say she was just telling the truth, but you know, Malfoy has been known to be dubious before. Why would she write it off? So, uh, haphazardly um she you know she's supposed to be a competent wizard uh, or witch rather but during the battle at the school she misses and she goes down during her fight with the death eaters uh, it's very complicated right um let's keep going on here what else will we have will we, this is such a long one and then you know you're in the deathly hallows and it's pretty obvious that the school has been taken over by the Crows and Snape, and she decides that the allegiance switch needs to happen now, and she switches back over from the Death Eater back over to the Order at the Battle of Hogwarts because she sees the writing on the wall and that she is going to win, right? So this is a very long one. Man, there was so much evidence I was not expecting from this. But, yeah, let me know what you guys think about down below about that one. Wizards are dying out. Yeah, this is kind of an undercurrent that you get through context clues throughout the entire series. But yeah, if you look at the population of England versus the population of its corresponding wizarding world, yeah, it makes it sound like the wizards are in fact dying out. 
And the evidence for that is, you know, for obviously Harry's small class size. There's only a handful of wizarding families left. And on top of that, it's just very small community. And the evidence that for the reason of this could be, you know, first we had Grindelwald. He was coming to power and apparently fighting people and killing people. The first wizarding war, not there's a couple of decades after that, where Voldemort killed numerous people in his rise to power. The second wizarding war, where so many different half blood and Muggleborns were dying out. You have purebloods for generations who are only allowing their children to marry and reproduce with other purebloods, which really limited the, the pool. Yeah, it, it, I think it's pretty uh, common sense that with all these events back to back to back, the wizarding world is just dying out. Um, and I hope that with you know the years leading up after the wizarding world, uh, wizarding wars, that this was kind of remedied a little bit, but there's no evidence for it. All right, this one, a uh, small trigger warning. If you want to skip this one, you can kind of go to this timestamp below. But yeah, Umbridge was raped by the centaurs. So the evidence for this is that obviously Umbridge was carried off by the centaurs, right? But we don't really ever know what happened to her. We just know that she had severe PTSD afterwards. And the theory that she was raped by the centaurs comes from the fact that centaurs and their namesake from Greek mythology are often sexualized cre creatures and are often uh, either sexually free or downright sexually assault people. And it would make sense that the centaurs in this world would take from their Greek counterparts and do the same thing. And that explains why Umbridge was so traumatized by the centaurs up to the point where even in uh, about a year later in the Half-Blood Prince, she keeps a nice distance between the centaurs and herself at Dumbledore's funeral. Uh, I mean, no one likes Umbridge, but that is a very dark, very dark secret. Riddle's diary would have caused two Voldemorts. So let's hypothetically talk about what would have happened if Tom Riddle's diary had come to full fruition and uh, she, you know, Jenny would have died, Harry wouldn't have been able to stop him, and Riddle would have came back in his entirety, right? So what would have happened there is we would have had a 16, 17-year-old Tom Riddle around at the same time as having a 78-year-old Voldemort rolling around, right? So how would that have worked? Uh, I mean, honestly, having two different Voldemorts at the same time is terrifying. Uh, and that goes to a lot of questions like, would the Riddle Diary, or would that have been covered by the Horcruxes? Uh, would it just be like a one-shoot, one-kill? Would Dumbledore have been able to defeat him since Riddle was so uh, young in comparison to his true self? Um, it, it's very complicated, but yeah, I personally believe that if the diary had worked out, if Lucius Malfoy's plan had come to full circle, it would have caused two Voldemorts to be alive at the same time. How are Horcruxes made? So the thing about this is we ever, we never actually get a explanation in the books or on Pottermore about the actual process of Horcrux making. Apparently JK Rowling had told her editor at one point the thought that she had for it. And it was so disgusting. Her editor threw up. So, but let's get into some of the most popular theory with it. And that refers back to the death eaters, right? So why are the death eaters called the death eaters? Well, originally we know they weren't actually called that. They were called the Knights of Wimborga or Wimborga, something to that effect. And later changed the name to the death eaters. But why would they do that? So the theory here is that in order to make a horcrux, after killing somebody, Voldemort does a spell on an object that he wants to infuse with his soul. And to make uh, it finalized, he has to actually eat the body of the dead person that he just killed in order to fully separate his soul and implant it into an object. It, and hence the name Death Eaters. It's morbid. It fits the criteria of it being so disgusting that her editor threw up. And it makes sense as why J.K. Rowling would never go on to publish that even on like Pottermore because she, you know, Harry Potter is such a big franchise. She wouldn't want it, uh, you know, people to go out into the real world and try to copy that, you know. Aberforth fucks goats. All right, this had to be on here somewhere, so let's get into it. Uh, basically, this theory says that there is that line in Goblet of Fire in Rita Skeeter's Big Scoop that Dumbledore says that his brother had been uh, somewhat infamously put on trial by the Ministry for experimental charms with goats. He never elaborates what that means, 
But a lot of people like to think or uh, to find it funny to think that Aberforth might have been having sexual relationships with goats. Uh, we know that Aberforth is very close with goats. He says that Ariana and him would go out and milk them. We know that his Patronus is a goat. Uh, it's not the most clean thing in the world, and I don't want to think about it too much. But I think it's just a very dirty version of what J.K. Rowling actually meant when she had Dumbledore say that in Goblet of Fire. Again, this one might be trigger warning worthy, but if you want to skip to the time step ahead to skip this one, go for it. All right, so magical rape. Um, so the idea of magical rape isn't the most out of the co- out of the world concept. It would make sense. Uh, sexual assault is unfortunately something that happens in all cultures. It would make sense that it would happen in the wizarding world, and unfortunately, it would probably be pretty easy to do so. You put somebody under a confundish charm, you put someone under an imperious curse, uh, where you just straight up sexually assault somebody, and then you just obliviate them and know they wouldn't be any of the wiser. Uh, it would be almost, it would make a lot of sense for it to be a concept inside of the Wizarding World. It's just something that obviously J.K. Rowling didn't want to emphasize just because it's a children's series. Uh, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think it would make a lot of sense um, for it to take place. James or Lily could have been each other's secret keeper, right? So this theory goes into why did they make Sirius, then later Peter, the secret keeper for the Godric's Hollow hideout that they had when they could have easily have just made one one of themselves the secret keeper. Um, uh, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, I don't know why. The real reason is because uh, J.K. Rowling needed to set up a betrayal by one of the Potters' close friends, and they couldn't. He, she just couldn't have... James or Lily be the secret keeper, but uh, unfortunately, this does leave the concept of why didn't they just pick Dumbledore, why they didn't just pick themselves to be their secret keeper. Um, Yeah, I really don't have a reason for this one. The most I can come up with is James was concerned that something would happen, one of them would die, which was very likely, and the secret would um be dispersed just like what did with Dumbledore um but even that's kind of a flimsy explanation so I really don't have much for you a Bogart's true form and can Mad-Eye Moody see it yeah so in Prisoner of Azkaban when the third years are tackling the Bogart we learn from uh, Hermione that a Bogart's form uh, is unknown to the most population simply because the moment you put your eyes on it, it's going to transform into your biggest fear. And then this goes on to uh, a further part of the series in Order of the Phoenix, when Mad-Eye Moody looks up through the uh, ceiling, up into a Bogart in the desk, and he says, yeah, that's definitely a Bogart, right? So that leads to the question, well, if that's the case, does Mad-Eye Moody actually know what a Bogart's true form is? Because the Bogart did not see Moody, it saw, but Moody saw it, and that just leads to that question, right? Um, I like to think that Moody definitely can see the true form of a Bogart. I think that kind of adds something cool to this character. Uh, If you don't want to believe that, it kind of makes sense in its own right. You could say that the magical properties of Bogart is it doesn't necessarily have to know that you're looking at it for it to transform and for it to turn into its biggest fear of Mad-Eye Moody. Uh, Mad-Eye Moody is just a badass and doesn't like uh, react to his biggest fear in that scene. But yeah, that's all we really have to say about that one. Voldemort's corpse in Godric's Hollow. So yeah, that leads to the question, what happened to Voldemort's body after his defeat at Godric's Hollow when Harry was a baby, right? Uh, Because we know that his soul was ripped out of his body and that he became, quote-unquote, less than the meanest ghost, but that means that his corpse had to be left somewhere, right? And we know that he didn't get his old body back because he had to use the potion and Goblet of Fire to make himself a new body. Uh, personally, I like to think that his body was actually just annihilated. It was atomized, basically, by the rebounding of Vada Kedavra curse. I like to think that Lily's protection not only saved Harry from the curse, but it also amplified the curse backfiring on him. And that when the you know the curse backfired, it not only just would have killed Voldemort, it would have completely annihilated his body. <laughs> 
Riddle turned Ginny into a Horcrux. Uh, so, yeah, this goes into the theory that we know that when Tom Riddle opened the Chamber of Secrets the first time, he would have been able to make a Horcrux, obviously, because he made the diary, right? So this says that when Tom Riddle came uh, out of the diary during the event of Chamber of Secrets, that he would have wanted to make another Horcrux, not knowing that his older self had already done so, and decided to turn Ginny into a Horcrux because she was his last or only real connection to anything in the outside world. Um, so my only problem with Ginny being a Horcrux, because it makes sense to a certain extent because Ginny does get possessed by a Horcrux, so it makes sense that Riddle would turn her into one at some point. My only problem with that is Riddle only got a physical form in order to hold a wand towards the end of the book. Basically, right at the point when Ginny goes down to the chamber, that's the, la that's the point where Riddle can hold a wand, perform spells. Um, also, he doesn't have a wand in the chamber. He has to take Harry's, if you'll remember. And I do believe that there's some kind of magic has to be done. I don't think teenage Voldemort was strong enough to do wandless magic yet, so that doesn't make sense either. And if you believe that, you know, to make a Horcrux, you have to eat the dead body of the person that you killed, then, yeah, I, uh, I don't really see how that works out, because Jenny did not get eaten. Also, he didn't kill anybody. The more I'm talking about this, the less I think it makes sense. The Gringotts break-in and Voldemort's death happened on the same day. So this is just kind of referring to the fact that the last few chapters of Deathly Hallow all take place in the matter of about 24 hours. We know that when the gang breaks in the Gringotts, they escape on the dragon, they land far away, they apparate the Hogsmeade, the Battle of Hogwarts takes place, and then Voldemort is dead. That all takes place on one day, and you can kind of imagine about how tired the Golden Trio was. Uh, yeah, it, that is exa an exhausting day. They break into one of the most powerful wizarding uh, constructions in the world and then fight Death Eaters. Voldemort himself destroyed three different Horcruxes, uh, four if you include Harry himself. It's a long day. Riddle's classmates would have been sent home during the Blitzkrieg. Yeah, so looking at the timeline of everything, it would make sense that during World War II, when Germany was attacking England during the Blitzkrieg, uh, that Hogwarts probably would have been hit too and probably probably would have sent home their students. Um, I don't necessarily think so necessarily, though. Because honestly, if you think about it, Hogwarts is probably the safest place for these students, uh, especially with Dumbledore being the Transfiguration teacher and all the spells and everything going on. Uh, at the same time, so I don't think necessarily that it would have been mandatory that they could have gotten sent home, but I can see that parents wanting to withdraw their students, uh, similar to what happens when Voldemort takes over, um, or when Dumbledore dies, I can see that being a possibility, but yeah, it's just kind of weird that, uh, it's not really weird, it's kind of interesting that, you know, these historical events all take place within the Harry Potter universe, and they're the, apparently the same as they are in this world. <laughs> The Department of Mysteries. So yeah, the Department of Mysteries is an interesting concept when you go back and you actually read that chapter about what they actually do there. So from the best I can tell, the Department of Mysteries studies forms of magic that are abstract or not well researched. They study advanced forms of astronomy as when um, Jenny and Ron and Luna run through that room, they notice that they're in the middle of basically space. They study the concept of love magic when Harry can't go to that room. Dumbledore later confirms that that's what that room is. They study time in the room of time. They study uh, the magical process of thought with the brain room. They study, and they even study death with the veil room. Um, I think it's very interesting that the, the Department of Mysteries and at large, the Ministry of Magic himself is so interested in these things. Because, you know, you go back up to the earlier tier where we talk about stagnant technology. Yeah, they weren't researching technology like we were, but they were researching advanced forms of magic that, you know, who knows, maybe two or three centuries from now, advanced astronomy will be so uh, not so commonplace that that's how astronomy will be taught at Hogwarts. Uh, I think that would make a lot of sense, and I just find it very interesting. I'd, honestly, if I was going to work in any department at the department of, uh, or at the ministry of magic it would probably be the department of mysteries <laughs> harry didn't need glasses they were just a fashion statement uh yeah i'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this one that's why i decided to not end the tier with this one um no he is quite blind without his glasses hermione says so that 
and she transforms into him in Deathly Hallows. His eyesight is awful. Um, his glasses get knocked off his face a couple times. He can't see very well. Um, no, they were definitely not a fashion statement. And finally, rounding off this tier, we have Death Eater Hagrid. Now, just like Death Eater McGonagall, this one has so many points. And honestly, I've decided after doing more research into both of these, I'm going to make separate videos about each of them and go through each point beat by beat. But for the purposes of this video, let's talk about just the evidence in the Philosopher's Stone, right? So the very first evidence is how did Hagrid get to the Potter so quickly? So we know that Hagrid lives at Hogwarts, and we know that Godric's Hollow is somewhere located in the western country so so side of England, right? That's a pretty far distance. We know that he can't apparate. We know that a broomstick can't hold his weight, and we know a Thestral probably can't either, right? So that is very hard to explain how he got there so quickly. This theory says, says that he got there so quickly because he was already on his way there uh, sh very, very shortly after uh, the death of Voldemort, right? Um, this theory says that basically Wormtail told Hagrid, they were both Death Eaters in this hypothetical, and uh, Hagrid knew that he had to uh, basically keep appearances or at very least try to show that he was on Dumbledore's side by going to get baby, uh, baby Harry from Godric's Hollow, right? But then you go into even more questions about how did he get get there because then you go, then you realize, like I just said, he can't apparate, he can't fly by normal magical means, and he didn't get Sirius's bike until he had already arrived at Godric's Hollow. This theory says that, you know, he learned how to fly uh, without any kind of system from Voldemort, just like Snape did. We know that Voldemort can do that. We, he flies all the time in book seven and he knows that, and we know that he taught Snape the same thing. So this theory says that Hagrid learned how to do so also, right? The next theory, part of the theory evidence inside of book one is that Hagrid is pretty certain that Voldemort is not dead, right? He says that it's called Swallop that, you know, he doesn't think that there's enough human left in him to die. That kind of maybe is an uh, uh, allegory or a hint at the Horcruxes. Maybe Hagrid knew about the Horcruxes, or at least the existence of a possible Horcrux. Maybe from maybe Regulus, perhaps, right? And in, in Deathly, or as I was in um, Goblet of Fire, you know, Voldemort says, "I asked myself, but how could they have believed I would not rise again?" You know, he has a point. There was an individual who did not who believed that he would rise again, and that is Hagrid. Then when um, Hagrid arrives at the Dursleys to pick up uh, Harry, he, Hagrid uses a form of transfiguration on Dudley. We know that transfiguration is a very challenging subject and that human transfiguration is advanced and only taught uh, six years. So how is he able to perform human transfiguration on Dudley or at least attempt to and get somewhat decent results, right? When he was expelled in third year. Well, maybe it's just because he learned how to do that from uh, Voldemort, right? Uh, next point of this, there is so much. I'm so sorry. The next point of this, Hagrid personally takes Harry to go see, uh, go to Diagon Alley. Who else is in Diagon Alley that same day? Quirrell, right? The, the most recent servant of Lord Voldemort. He buys Harry a very conspicuous and easily surveyed owl. It's pointed out in book five that she's a snowy owl and that it'd be very easy to track. Um, Hagrid personally takes Harry into the forest to talk to uh, to get to Voldemort in that chapter in book one. Um, you know, Hagrid is constantly endangering Harry's life with dragon eggs and uh, Fluffy. Um, Hagrid, real, <laughs> Hagrid tells the trio about how to get past Fluffy and more about the Sorcerer's Stone. And, uh, you know, Hagrid sends the trio alone into Voldemort's camp at the end of the book. There is so much to go on here. I don't like it's it's ridiculous how long this point is. That is just Philosopher's Stone. That's not even getting into the other books. So I'm going to make an entire video about how Death Eater Hagrid works out as a theory. Uh, I don't personally believe it, but man, is that evidence kind of fun to think about. And finally, we're down to the final tier of the iceberg. Guys, this iceberg was simply amazing. I'm going to link it down below. I haven't seen a more thorough, more you know, kooky, tinfoily iceberg before. And things that are genuinely curious, like the Death Eaters with the McGonagall and Hagrid. I never even thought about that before now, but now I'm actually talking myself into it. But let's start this final tier off with...
Draco is a werewolf, not a Death Eater. Uh, so the Draco is a werewolf theory has been around for a while, but him not being a Death Eater, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. But the theory that Draco is a werewolf is pretty prevalent. So we know in Half-Blood Prince, Draco is described as being more pale than usual, very sallow-faced. People have gone through and tried to line up the points where Harry sees Draco in that book with uh, a lunar cycle and have pointed out that Draco looks very, very weak or very, very unwell around the points of a full moon. We know that Draco is aware of Fenrir Greyback because he threatens Borgen with him in the Draco's Detour chapter. So... Yeah, the the theory that Draco is a werewolf is not unfounded. My biggest problem with it, though, is I don't know if Draco would not go to Dumbledore's side, if that makes sense, after being bit by, being bit by a werewolf. You know, I don't. I I really just feel like had had Voldemort gone to that extreme so quickly, D- uh, Draco would have immediately gone over and at least tried to help. Yeah, you can say that. Yes, the extreme of Voldemort killing his mother and his father and himself was on the table and that didn't take Drake over to Dumbledore's side. But I don't know. I think that it's very, uh, not likely that that Draco became a werewolf, but I see the evidence for it. Crookshanks was the Potter's cat. So yeah, in the Deathly Hallows, when Harry finds the letter from his mom to Sirius, it is mentioned that the Potters had a cat. Unfortunately, we never actually find out what happened to that cat after the death of the Potters. Harry theorizes that it might have died in the explosion. It could have just ran away with no one else to feed it. Uh, But this theory says that Crookshanks was actually the Potters cat. We know that Crookshanks had been at the pet store in Diagon Alley for several years. No one had ever really wanted it because of of its smashed face. It having a smashed face could point to it being in some kind of massive kind of ordeal like the destruction of the Potters house. We know that Crookshanks uh, immediately was drawn to Sirius and was able to help Sirius out. Uh, but the thing is, not only the weird thing about everything, though, is Crookshanks attacked Peter before Crookshanks would have met Sirius. So it's very likely that, you know, if Crookshanks had met Peter beforehand, you know, it being a measle, it could have, you know, figured out that, oh, this person betrayed my old owners. I'm going to get revenge for it. And that makes sense as to why Crookshanks would have attacked uh, Scabbers slash Peter Pettigrew before ever even coming into contact with Sirius. A corpse or ghost passing through the veil. Yeah, this is a very interesting one. Uh, so we know that the veil in the Department of Mysteries is designed to be a gateway from our world into the next, right? So what happens when a ghost travels through the veil? So, Nearly Headless Nick says that he is neither here nor there. He is not here in the real world or in the afterlife. He uh, made a decision when he died to stay in the mortal coil as a ghost. And he decided... But what would have happened if he had decided to travel through the veil? Would he just pass on to the afterlife? Would he simply go through it because he is neither here nor there and does not belong? It's an interesting thought experiment. And I honestly think that if, like, let's say Moni Mortal were to cross over through the veil, I think that the afterlife would be forced to take her because we know that the veil isn't just a physical construct. It's a magical one and a ghost passing through it. I don't think would be any more different than Sirius passing through it. So yeah, I like that theory a lot. Um, Let me know what you guys think about the veil. The veil is one of those magical objects that are just so mysterious that you can come up with a number of theories about it. The defense against the dark arts curse makes each professor live out their worst fear. So yeah, so the big biggest theory with the curse on the defense against the dark arts position is that you simply get fired at the end of each one. But if you actually look at it, uh, not necessarily. You would think that Voldemort would have put a curse on it that makes each one die. But no, not really. It, they just have very bad things happen to them. And as you can tell, it's their worst fears. So let's go through the list here. So we have Quirrell. Quirrell's had a big fear of almost everything, and he died by Defense Against the Dark Arts, ironically, right? Uh, Lockhart. Lockhart was, his biggest fear was getting his memories wiped and having been outed as a fraud. Those things happened. Lupin. Lupin's biggest fear is being outed as a werewolf and being ostracized at Hogwarts. That happened. Moody, hit one of his biggest uh, fears in life was being defeated by a dark wizard and being taken out of the fight. That happened. Umbridge, her biggest fear was half-breeds. 
and who took her out of the equation? The centaurs. Snape. Now, Snape is kind of interesting, but his that may be his worst fear, but one of the things that he wanted to keep close to his heart, the thing that made him feel like a good person, was his loyalty to Dumbledore. And he had to, you know, on the surface, betray that loyalty. I guess you could also, you know, put the Caros into that position. Uh, I guess you could say their biggest fear was Voldemort not being in control anymore. Maybe, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's... Um, that is a very fun theory. I like it a lot, and I find it very, very likely that that's the case. Voldemort used Bertha's unborn fetus for resurrection. This is one of the darkest theories in the Harry Potter fandom, but I'm kind of twisted, and I kind of like it. So, at the very beginning of Goblet of Fire, we know that Voldemort had a body. He had a very small infant body, right? Now, on the surface, we thought that maybe, you know, Peter Pettigrew being back and milking Nagini's uh, venom and, you know, making a uh, potion was giving him some kind of body back, right? But that doesn't really make sense because that only made him stronger. It didn't give him a physical form to reside in, right? You can't really feed a potion to a ghost, if that makes sense. And we know that Voldemort can possess things. Uh, but so, but we, and we also know that Voldemort killed Bertha Jer- Jorkins. Uh, earlier in between the summers of book three and book four. So this theory posits what if Bertha was pregnant and upon her death, Voldemort realized that, or maybe under the use of Veritas serum or the Cruciatus curse, Voldemort realized that Bertha was pregnant and he simply, uh, you know, sliced out the fetus and became, uh, used it to possess. Uh, it's a very, very dark theory. But honestly, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Why would Voldemort put himself in a position to use a fetal a fetal body when, honestly, a snake would be more powerful? Um, it it's very interesting. It's dark as hell, and I I gotta say I kind of believe it. All right, this is probably the most silliest one on this on this last tier, but. Dumbledore enchanted Harry's glasses to spy on him. This goes back to how in the world Dumbledore was spying on Harry. Uh, Dumbledore says that he's kept a close eye on Harry, closer than Harry even knows. Uh, So how in the world was that done? Maybe Dumbledore enchanted Harry's glasses to spy on him. We know that Dumbledore was alone with Harry in the medical ward at the end of book one. Uh, So, yeah, and and book one, ironically, is the book where Dumbledore seems to have the least amount of um, knowledge about what Harry is up to at any given point. So, yeah, I I guess it could make sense. I guess you could kind of work your way around the tumbleweed of that theory. But this is kind of the last silly one that we have on here, um, and I kind of appreciate it. Neville needed his own wand. Yeah, so this is a, not only just a Neville thing, this is a Ron thing also. So, in at the end of Order of the Phoenix, Neville's wand is snapped in half during the battle at the Department of Mysteries, and Neville says that his grand will kill him because that wand had belonged to his father. Uh, well, earlier in you know book three, when Ron gets a new wand after his was broken in book two, uh, we notice a, de- a definite up level of Ron um, with his new wand and you know at the end of order the at the end of order of the phoenix the beginning of deathly hallows we see the same thing with neville with that being a take up in his abilities right so we know that the wand chooses the wizard and that you know a wizard's power will only be its strongest when using a wand that is suitable for him or her and yeah i think that it makes a lot of sense that the reason neville was so lackluster in the sense that you know he had very magical powerful parents why in the world was his magical ability so inept at the very beginning of the series well it's because he was using a wand that was just not meant for him for the next two entries on the iceberg i'm going to put a trigger warning as they both involve some kind of sexual assault so if that is something you don't want to listen to you can obviously skip to this timestamp for the last two entries on the iceberg but first of all we have lockhart sexually assaulted students and erased their memories so this theory says that Lockhart had a lot of female students who were obsessed with him. Even the very level-headed Hermione was known to have a minor crush on him. And this theory says that some of the older females, maybe 5th, 6th, and 7th years, um, they would have been more likely to approach Lockhart for a some kind of relationship or just to 
um, say that they have a crush. Obviously, Lockhart cannot have a sexual relationship or even a romantic relationship with a student. So what he would do is he would have sex with them and then erase their memories. Um, I mean, probably not. Uh, it, that's even a little bit too dark for this series, especially that early on in the series. But I understand where people are coming from. Lockhart is very established at being able to do memory charms extremely well. It is set up in the book that a lot of the students have crushes on him. Lockhart says that he gets a lot of Valentines from various students uh, around Valentine's Day. But, yeah, I just don't think that it's plausible, but I see where you're coming from, if you want to believe it. Ariana was gang-raped. So, in the story that Aberforth tells the Golden Trio about Ariana's attack, he says that a group of muggle boys have been spying on her and saw her perform magic, and then when she couldn't reproduce that magic, they got angry and, you know, attacked her. This theory says that not only did they attack her, they gang-raped her. Um, the reason being is why were they spying on her in the first place? They could say, one could say that they might have found her physically attractive and that they were committing some form of peeping Tom on her when they saw the magic. When she couldn't reproduce the magic, they felt like they lost control of the... The, the mentors can sense Voldemort's soul inside of Harry. So, yeah, I actually kind of believe this one. Um, you ever notice that the Dementors pay, like, a special attention to Harry a lot of the time? Uh, it's mentioned that when, you know, they swarm the field at the Quidditch, at the Quidditch match, they basically only ever attack Harry. Um, they pretty much track down Harry immediately when uh, Hayes was serious outside the lake. Um, in Book 7, there's that scene where Harry is going into town to pick up supplies. And the, the Dementor seems to be going straight at Harry, even though there's no way for the Dementor to really suspect Harry be there in the first place. Why was there a Dementor in a random town in a muggle area? Like Fudge said, that's kind of high odds that that would happen. They were probably drawn to Harry. So yeah, this is basically saying that, that because Dementors eat souls, they were able to feel that, that Harry had a little bit extra on his, and it made a very delicious meal. And finally, the last theory on this iceberg is Arthur Weasley was a victim of the Imperius Curse during the First Wizarding War. Uh, it would make a lot of sense for Arthur to be a victim of the Imperius Curse. He was a worker in the office of Muggle Objects. It would make a lot of sense for Voldemort to want somebody in that office so he could attack Muggles a little bit easier, or at the very least put somebody in there that would not investigate it. Uh, we know that uh, Arthur has a lot of experience, apparently, with the Imperius Curse, and uh, it explains why Arthur has such a very specific hatred towards Lucius Malfoy. It's theorized that Lucius Malfoy would have been the one to put Arthur under the, under the Imperius Curse. Uh, and why he's so angry when uh, Lucius Malfoy gets acquitted of that charge after the war is over. Um, there's more. Ev the other evidence is when Barty Crouch Jr. was disguised as Mad Eye Moody during the class when he's teaching the Unforgivable Curses. Uh, Ron is the one that gives up the. Uh, the uh, information about the Imperius Curse and Barty Crouch Jr. says, yes, your father would know a lot about that. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that makes a whole lot of sense about why he would um, be under the Imperius Curse. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. And with that, guys, we are done with every single theory on this iceberg. Uh, looking at my records here, I see that I've done probably close to 153 different theories. Granted, most of them are around a minute long, but I think that I wanted to go into some of these deeper in their own videos. Let me know which ones you want more detail on in their own videos. I already plan on doing one over the Death Eater Hagrid and Death Eater McGonagall theories because that one really fascinated me when I did research on it. But yeah, I am. If you sit, if you stayed for this entire video, freaking power to you, man. I really was not expecting that. But um, let me know how you guys think this video worked out. Let me know what your favorite theory on the iceberg was. And without further ado, I will see you guys next time.